I'm going to take you through the entire manga series of Super and show you how strong everybody gets since the end of the Boo Saga. Right now, this is the manga only. I'm not using anything from the anime yet, but I will start the anime scale for Super once the manga one is complete. Also, I'm not using anything from the movies. I'm using the established basics that I've used for the rest of my scaling in Z and GT, which include domination multipliers, which are official and have been portrayed in a large part of Dragon Ball Z to gauge how much a fight it can overwhelm an opponent. I'll also be using official guide multipliers. But other than that, 99% of the scaling will be just what we see in the manga itself, because there are no official guide multipliers the Super Saiyan God onwards. The Dragon Ball Super manga is far more broken than you ever imagined. There are certain power jumps that even happen because of the plot, just like GT, but I will do my best in explaining these jumps. We're going to keep this as grounded as possible and focus on the raw power increase from what we see. For the purposes of this power scale, Buu Saga base Goku equals 1. If you want to work out how much stronger someone is compared to Super Saiyan 3 Goku versus Kid Buu, just divide any answer in this power scale by 400, as that's the Super Saiyan 3 multiplier and Kid Buu was similar in raw power to Super Saiyan 3 Goku. But because I'm a nice guy, I'll calculate how strong key characters are from Kid Buu. But remember, this is not a power level scale. This is just a good old fashioned raw power scale. And you'll understand why I'm trying to keep the numbers as low as possible. Dragon Ball Super gets ridiculous. <laughs> We're starting with the Battle of God saga, and all we get in terms of time skips in the manga is that some time has passed. In Goku's mind, we see him fight in Frieza, Cell, and then about to fight Boo. Boo, it was not concluded in his mind, and the mental image training doesn't really hold any weight. But Goku implies he's been training since Boo, so his power goes up a tier by 1.25 times. For anyone wondering why 1.25, like I said, I work with domination multipliers. If you're 1.25 times stronger than the opponent, you can start to overwhelm them, meaning you're a tier above them. But if you're two times stronger, you can tank them unharmed. And that's backed up with official material in the Daizenshu about emitting twice the power to negate attacks. And it is also proven in the Saiyan and Freezer sagas with power differences. So I think domination multipliers are reasonable and keeps everything grounded. And in terms of training growth, if we cannot establish how much stronger someone has got or any way to gauge it, then we go with a 1.25 times increase because it applies at least some growth. Never underestimate 1.25 times. Anyway, Goku arrives on King Kai's planet and only just starts training before Beerus arrives. So no additional growth there. Beerus absolutely wastes Super Saiyan 3 Goku. So right now, all we know is Super Saiyan 3 Goku in the Boo Saga is 400. Super Saiyan 3 Goku in Battle of Gods is 500. Beerus unknown. Like I said, I'm not going to guess any levels of power unless we can gauge them reliably or to something. So Beerus will be a question mark for a while, especially with how Dragon Ball Super works. And just so you know, in the manga, there is absolutely no dialogue about fusion not being enough to take on Beerus. So we will not be using any of that as a gauge for the manga. Goku literally gets up and goes straight to Earth. But what we do have is Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks and then Gohan in his fighting gi with the ultimate Gohan look. But because some time has passed since the Buu Saga, not knowing if it's months or even years, it's unknown exactly the power difference in both. Or even with good Buu, there's not enough reliable information to suggest Gohan, Trunks and Goten continue training after Buu's defeat. And suggesting all of them are weaker or stronger since the Buu Saga with no evidence of training would be unreliable. There's no information to prove either way. So we will keep Gotenks and Gohan as they are in the Buu Saga. Definitely check out my Dragon Ball Z power scale. It'll help you understand where they are in terms of scaling. But I've extracted that scale and put it into this one. Ultimate Gohan is 61 times stronger than Super Saiyan 3 Goku and Kid Buu, making him 24,400. Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks, 16,000. Again, the Dragon Ball Z power scale has it all. Now, the first big power jump in the Dragon Ball Super manga is actually Vegeta after Bulma got hit by Beerus. Goku and Vegeta's base forms are relatively the same, and it's always suggested Vegeta continues to train. But here, Vegeta enrages and reaches a new level of Super Saiyan 2 power. The highest power we've had so far is Ultimate Gohan, who has failed against Beerus. So the only reasonable level 
we can put Vegeta at is a tier above Gohan, so that would narrow down any big head cannon guesses. So Vegeta literally got over 200 times stronger from this power jump, and is currently at this point in the manga the strongest Z fighter. It's up to you whether you think Vegeta keeps the power he unlocked through his rage. You would have to prove he loses the power because there are many instances in the Dragon Ball series where fighters achieve a new level of power through rage, or take power from others and make it their own. Dragon Ball Z was huge for power-ups through rage, and apart from Gohan when he was young and didn't know how to control his rage, every other instance of rage, Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2, the rage unlocks power and they keep the power. So based on that, I see Vegeta's rage a trigger to unlock in more of his own potential than it being a temporary attack. And that would make sense because it's rare to see Vegeta in this emotional state. It's a new trigger for him. Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta with his new power in Battle of Gods, 30,500. So how strong is Super Saiyan God in the manga? Well, first of all, because this is the manga, we don't have the same valuable ways to gauge it like in the anime. We don't have a failed Super Saiyan God ritual either, or statements like Goku's power is the highest in history. We don't have fusion won't be enough. What we have instead is Goku referring to Super Saiyan God as a whole new world just opened up to him. We don't have the same situation with the shockwaves related to one more punch means everything is destroyed. We only see Goku and Beerus clash with each other and the old Kai saying the shockwaves are reaching them, causing no immediate damage there. But he does go on to say, at this rate, the universe will be destroyed. Now, at this rate is quite broad. We don't know how long Goku and Beerus have been fighting for, or how long it's going to take for the universe to be destroyed. The anime locks onto it very well and says literally, the next punch will destroy everything. Here in the manga, it's their battle as a whole that will eventually destroy the entire universe, not their specific third punch. Now, of course, the feat in itself is incredible, but at this rate, it's quite loose. And if you go with the whole, how many solar systems in a galaxy, how many galaxies in a universe, how many dimensions in universe seven, etc. Then multiply base Goku by this amount, then this amount. I've done it that way before, mainly for the anime, because you've got more to play with in terms of the dialogue and the situation. But in the manga, at this rate, not so much to play with. The manga's dialogue can be interpreted differently and messes with everyone's numbers going with which way you calculate it. So, in the manga, I'm gauging the officially unknown Super Saiyan God power narratively combined with number scaling from the previous Strongest Fighter and comparing it to the whole new world of power dialogue, which I think is the best way to gauge it for the manga. So the last big level of power in Dragon Ball that we know is Vegito. A reliable fusion multiplier I've used in the past that combines multiple source material because there's so much on fusion, but after combining it all and working out a happy medium, the best fusion multiplier is the strongest of A plus the strongest of B, then multiply that amount by 100. In Buu Saga Vegito's case, it would be Super Saiyan 3 Goku plus Super Saiyan 2 Vegeta, then times 100. The reason why I've included Super Saiyan 3 Vegito here is because when Goku was part of Vegito, he would be aware of what he can do and what he was holding back. It's reasonable to suggest Vegito had Super Saiyan 3, especially when Gotenks had Super Saiyan 3. Goku understands the power magnification of Super Saiyan 3, and therefore, Goku would have been aware of that world of power within Vegito. A rough estimation anyway. Now for Super Saiyan God to be a new world of power above Super Saiyan 3 Vegito, it would have to be able to dominate Super Saiyan 3 Vegito clean. So to dominate a theoretical Buu Saga Vegito, Super Saiyan God would have to be at bare minimum two times Super Saiyan 3 Vegito, making it 40 million. A 32 million multiplier from base form is an insane upgrade of a multiplier compared to the previous form, Super Saiyan 3's 400 times base form. You may think two times another power, in this case, Super Saiyan 3 Vegito, is not a whole new world of power, and you could argue that, but you also shouldn't underestimate two times stronger, and the ability to tank attacks unharmed. Anything above two times Super Saiyan 3 Vegito for the manga is amplified headcanon, but at least two times is the minimal amount of headcanon to calculate a form that's never actually been given a simple straightforward official multiplier through guides or dialogue. So I go with two times Super Saiyan 3 Vegito, and nobody would ever, ever want to mess with Super Saiyan 3 Vegito.
In terms of Beerus, how strong is he here? Well, we don't know his full power at this point. We only see a performance in which he handles Goku and is able to overwhelm him. In fact, Goku hardly gains any ground on him and is exhausted, and Beerus is laughing. So Beerus' suppressed Battle of Gods performance in the manga didn't reach two times Super Saiyan God Goku, so 1.5 times Goku for the midpoint is absolutely fine here. Beerus is 60 million. Beerus uses a Sphere of Destruction. Goku uses his Kamehameha, which overpowers the Sphere. Kamehameha is a 2x2 two two boost. The Sphere is 1.25 times weaker at minimum to get defeated by the Kamehameha. The obviously suppressed Sphere that Beerus used is a 1.2x boost in this case. We steps in and jokingly says, this battle is undecided, but it's quite clear. Goku is hammered. Beerus is laughing, standing tall. This is a hint to a future contest as Beerus sees potential in Goku. Beerus mentions people are out there stronger than Goku can ever imagine. We don't know exactly what Beerus is referring to and if he's comparing his own power. So for now, we will hold back until we get more information. And that's it for Battle of Gods. This power scale for Battle of Gods ends with base Vegeta being 244 times stronger than Goku due to Goku getting no evidential base power boosts, whereas Vegeta did. However, Goku is far stronger at max power due to the Super Saiyan God transformation. Insane. But fear not, in the next arc, the base levels between Goku and Vegeta start to equal out for plot convenience. This is what we are given in the manga, and that's what I intend to deliver to you guys without the headcanon. Just because something sounds stupid or is badly written, or isn't deeply thought about, doesn't make it untrue. And also, this is very important. There is no absorption of the Super Saiyan God power into the base form in the manga. So get that out of your head now. Saiyan Beyond God only exists in the Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F promotional manga. It's a Dragon Ball Z promotional manga which was unfinished and is therefore not connected to the Dragon Ball Super manga that we are analyzing. So Saiyan Beyond God doesn't exist in Dragon Ball Super the manga. Also the pamphlet for Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F about godlike power without changing form. It's for Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F the movie not Dragon Ball Super. That's important to note. And in terms of how much stronger Super Saiyan God Goku Beerus and Vegeta are compared to Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Kid Buu. Super Saiyan God Goku is a hundred thousand times stronger than Kid Buu. The suppressed Beerus we see in the Battle of Gods manga is a hundred and fifty thousand times stronger than Kid Buu. And Vegeta's new Super Saiyan 2 power is 76 times stronger than Kid Buu vs Super Saiyan 3 Goku. Thanks for waiting, Kid. When we move on to the time frame around Resurrection F in the manga, Goku and Vegeta's base forms appear level in sparring. This is important because it balances out Goku and Vegeta's base forms for the Universe 6 arc. The detailed events of Resurrection F are actually skipped in the manga, so we do not know exactly how the events play out in manga form. We just know the main events did play out in some way. So again, we can only take what we see in the manga because we know with evidence that anime events differ from manga events. Anyway, we see Goku and Vegeta training after the events of Golden Freezer. We do not know the time span, it just says recently. As we go along, we may find out the time span, but in terms of power, the only information we get is after meeting Beerus, Goku and Vegeta went to Whis for training. Their strength evolved into a power that surpassed even God, Super Saiyan Blue. So when it says evolved, it literally means they obtained Super Saiyan Blue, which is stronger than Super Saiyan God. That's it in simple terms, thus implying both obtained Blue and both obtained God. So in terms of their base form power-ups, we currently know there have been two periods of training, once before Resurrection F to obtain Blue, and now in this chapter, after the Freezer events. Remember, this is training with Whis and Angel, so power growth is expected in terms of base, especially if they did achieve Blue. They had to have trained hard, which means we can apply the minimum training boost of 1.25 times to base strength for each of the two training times, 
meaning they go up two tiers of power in base. Vegeta initially had the higher base going in, coming off Battle of Gods, so we will calculate his and then match Goku's to his because that's where Goku is now due to plot balance. And it makes more sense for Goku's base to catch up to Vegeta's than it is for Vegeta's to get weaker and go down to Goku's. So in this scale, we have base Goku and Vegeta at 380. This is during the first training with Whis. Upon them getting Super Saiyan Blue for the first time, their Super Saiyan Blue power is 600 billion, making the Super Saiyan Blue multiplier 1.6 billion from base form. We cannot give a reading for Freezer here because we don't know the details about his power in the manga at this point. We just know he was defeated. After Golden Freezer, the second training period with Whis, as I said, Goku and Vegeta's base forms could reasonably go up a tier and would now be 475, making them 475 times stronger than their Buu Saga selves. And it's worth noting that their base forms at this point in Dragon Ball Super, could handle Kid Buu. The Super Saiyan Blue power would now reach 760 billion. Once the arc initiates for the Universe 6 tournament, Goku and Vegeta train together, presuming all out for three years straight. It's important to note that there is no specified increase to power in the manga, so literally any increase will be headcanon. But based on previous training knowledge, we know Goku and Vegeta do get stronger through training, so some growth would be reasonable. But we have to minimize it as much as possible and keep a lid on the head cannon increases. And that's why I'm only increasing their power by 1.25 times at this point, as it's still clear when they leave the time chamber and fight the Super Saiyan Blue, their stamina is still appalling. So a little more than 1.25 times is fine for three years of training in order to keep our numbers as grounded as possible. Super Saiyan Blue Goku and Vegeta, one trillion. He defended himself in that time skip by predicting our hit one attack. Damn, Kekron makes it sound like it's child's play. In the first round of the tournament, Goku fights Botamo. And it's stated Goku is definitely stronger, but he can't inflict damage on Botamo's abilities. Goku literally overpowers him massively, but he is not tanking levels. So 1.75 times Botamo. Goku then fights Frost and is able to overwhelm his first form massively. He is essentially just toying with Frost. But then third form Frost is able to start overwhelming base Goku. Frost, we're using his final form, the same as Freezer's on Namek, but not the buff 100% version. So essentially, his growth is similar to that of 50% Freezer here. Put in Super Saiyan Goku at 31,250. Vegeta takes on Frost, but it's worth mentioning the whole point of Piccolo's fight was to tire out Frost as much as possible before Vegeta steps in which was what happened. Frost was breathing heavy and was losing his cool. Vegeta steps in as a Super Saiyan and wipes out Frost much faster than Goku could. So I put that down to the battle condition of Frost, not Vegeta being currently stronger than Goku. Super Saiyan Vegeta fights Mageta. And I don't want to dive into lifting feats because lifting feats are super inconsistent in Dragon Ball. But if it's worth anything to you and you think lifting feats retcon themselves as time goes on, then Super Saiyan Vegeta at this point can't lift a weight of around 1,000 tons, maybe less, as it was just one leg of Mageta. In terms of Mageta's power, he could almost tank Super Saiyan Vegeta's attacks, but Vegeta feared fighting him up close, so 1.75 times Super Saiyan Vegeta is reasonable. That was until the insults and Mageta totally lost his battle spirit. When Vegeta fights Kaba, Kaba gets the initial advantage by using strategic methods to fight Vegeta. However, once Vegeta regained his composure and saw through it, he smashed Kaba down comfortably. Vegeta says Kaba in his normal state is about as strong as himself, but obviously the way they both look after the scuffle, you could fool me. So I put base Vegeta at 1.25 times Kaba after he got around those strategic moves, where Kaba is still strong enough to damage him if he connects. However, Super Saiyan Blue demolishes Kaba, no competition. You show poor judgment, Goku. Now that I know what you're doing, I can outwit you by being harder to predict. When it comes to hit, things are very interesting in terms of Goku and Vegeta's power comparisons. We states Vegeta wasn't even able to perform at 10% of Super Saiyan Blue's usual strength due to the overuse of it. And Beerus asking if Super Saiyan God Goku had surpassed Vegeta's weakened blue and hit. With we saying yes, possibly. In order to make sense of this, because it is confusing, Super Saiyan God Goku is the best benchmark to work from as it appears to be a non-weakened Super Saiyan God. What you should take from this is that Vegeta was extremely weakened whilst in blue against hit 
due to this reason, over 50 times weaker than his normal blue self. We say a not even 10% is very true. It's more like Vegeta was around 1-2% to power as 2% of blue would be level with Super Saiyan God due to the 50 times multiplier. Quite a ridiculous drop in power if you ask me, but it was stated, and this was the whole point of the fight, to realize the blue had a severe stamina weakness you couldn't keep turning it on and off. So, due to Hit easily dealing with Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta, but stated to be drastically weaker than Super Saiyan God Goku, I give the following measurements of power. Also, do note that Suppressed Hit was toying with Super Saiyan 1 Goku. Now Hit powers up. Super Saiyan Blue is able to break through Hit's time skip, meaning it has no effect on Super Saiyan Blue. As previously stated, Hit's techniques won't work on those stronger than him. So Super Saiyan Blue is stronger than Hit and able to send him flying and the Kamehameha put Hit in fear. He dodges it, and the fight is settled with Goku finding out that Hit has deadly techniques that can make him stronger and even kill Goku, but couldn't use them during the fight, otherwise he would be disqualified. Taking that into account, I see Super Saiyan Blue Goku as 1.25 times Hit's raw power, but Hit's deadly techniques could still kill Goku if he connects with him. Being 1.25 times stronger doesn't mean you are invincible or cannot die. It just means you can overwhelm an opponent with raw power, which is what happened with Super Saiyan Blue vs. Hit. He did that. And to back this up, at the end of the fight, it stated Goku and Vegeta could have beat Hit if at full power. So Super Saiyan Blue Goku at 1 trillion, Hit full power in terms of his raw power at 800 billion, where his deadly techniques could still kill Goku. Now this is very important and you shouldn't skip this part. There are power jumps in Dragon Ball, whether it be the anime or manga, Dragon Ball Z, Dragon Ball Super, Dragon Ball GT, there are power creeps, power jumps that just happen. Some are so bad and unbelievable, happening out of nowhere, that there is absolutely no way to make sense of them than to simply accept that they are just bad. A lot of fans try to make sense of certain things in Dragon Ball, particularly power, but in reality, some things are simply just written bad, without much thought. And if we try to salvage it with our head and apply some theory, then all we've done is create headcanon to cope with it for our own version of Dragon Ball, which is fine and harmless as headcanon, but in terms of what actually happens, it's inaccurate. And we just need to look at it for what it is. And that's how this power scale works. Whatever happens in the manga power I'm just gonna straight up show you what happens. Bad or not, we're not making sense of it, we're simply counting it. Remember, Toyotaro, Toriyama, they don't write things with an in-depth power scale in mind. They write for the story and decide some characters are stronger at specific times because they feel like telling the story that way. And let me tell you right now, in the Goku Black arc of the Dragon Ball Super manga, you're gonna see some of the most diabolical power jumps in Dragon Ball. This arc breaks the Dragon Ball Super manga, believe me. They get insanely strong. Now, if you're unfamiliar with big numbers after millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, then now is the time to get used to them. I recommend you looking up the different levels of numbers so you know what Noctilian is. And no, it's not an octopus crossed with a lion. Kicking off this arc, we get to see Goku and Vegeta in a sparring match at Capsule Corp. And Goku stated Vegeta has gotten better. Now, better can be interpreted in so many ways. We also don't know the time span but it's presumed the two have kept up their training. So a 1.25 times increase, a tier boost to their base power is acceptable here. It's worth noticing Beerus doesn't think much of Goku and Vegeta here. In the future timeline, Goku Black in base takes on future Trunks. Trunks gives his absolute all as a Super Saiyan 2, but Goku Black is almost able to tank a Masenko. Masenko is similar to a Kamehameha in that it raises power multiple times, Kamehameha being 2.2 times, so let's go with two times in this case. Goku Black, base form, almost tanks it, so I put in 1.75 times the Masengo. But we need to go where Trunks fought Goku at Capsule Corp. He states he's fought Goku Black for one year, and also states he trained and got a lot stronger, but it still wasn't enough. Actually saying he's trained himself to death over the 10 years. Plus this is now some time after the Dabura fight, which justifies why Trunks' base form now is above a Buu Saga Super Saiyan 3 Goku, whereas he needed Super Saiyan 2 to beat Dabura previously. Trunks has gotten a lot stronger. Now when Goku and Trunks fight, we says that Trunks and Goku at Super Saiyan 2 are almost equal. 
Trunks having slightly more skill. But we shall go with equal in raw power as Goku managed to block his sword attacks with his finger pretty swiftly too. Super Saiyan 3 Goku then reveals himself and Trunks responds with an upgraded Super Saiyan 2 which is stated to be the level with the current Super Saiyan 3 Goku's power. It's important to note, Goku was not suppressed in his Super Saiyan 3 power here against Trunks. At that moment in time, the whole intention was to show how much Trunks' Super Saiyan 2 upgraded power rivals Super Saiyan 3 without transforming into Super Super Saiyan 3 and the whole reason why Goku went Super Saiyan God for a split second was to end it. It doesn't make sense for Super Saiyan 3 Goku to be suppressed and he supposedly could have ended it in one shot. He didn't. He couldn't. That's why he went Super Saiyan God. So take a look at these levels of power in this scale. So it makes sense that Trunks' massive growth happened as soon as Goku Black turned up. In terms of Zamasu in the main timeline, he is at least 1.25 times Kabito during their match. It was stated in previous guidebooks that Kabito could give Gohan a good fight unless Gohan transformed at the start of the Buu Saga. So if Buu Saga base Goku is a 1 in this scale, Gohan around the time of the 25th Budokai Tenkaichi was less than a 1. So Zamasu here in the main timeline is literally a 1 at best. Now this is where we get an insane power up for Vegeta. Goku, Vegeta and Trunks travel to the future and encounter Goku Black. They both fight as Super Saiyan 2. If you think he's a Super Saiyan 1, it really doesn't matter because that 2 times boost is not going to make much difference in the grand scale of things. I'm going with Super Saiyan 2 due to the mass amount of electricity between Vegeta and Goku Black. Now what's also important to note, Trunks talks to Mai about Goku Black becoming a Super Saiyan and Trunks says, but somehow he's gotten much stronger since the last time I fought him. Now it's reasonable to believe Trunks isn't referring to the Super Saiyan power up because he knows full well Super Saiyan powers up the body. He's actually referring to Goku Black's base strength going into the fight with Vegeta. Trunks later says that Goku Black's Super Saiyan form is even stronger, so there's a passive growth going on. But right now, Goku Black is at least 1.5 times stronger than before, as Trunks refers to Goku Black's power as much stronger. But what's even crazier is Vegeta's Super Saiyan 2 starts to overwhelm Goku Black, and that's a fact. Now, it could be Vegeta's base has just been higher than Goku's for a while, and that's why Goku said to Vegeta, you've gotten better, meaning Vegeta wasn't even trying in base form against Goku back at Capsule Corp. Or it could just be flat out that Vegeta got a massive plot power up over the last day. And so is Goku. Either way, they result in the same. Vegeta's base is currently 2,625 times stronger than Goku's at Capsule Corp. And Vegeta's base back then, if this is now a plot power up both Goku and Vegeta grow exponentially over this day since Capsule Corp, but keeping them equal for now is safe until further statements appear. Goku Black gets healed by Zamas of the future, and it's stated he is benefiting from Zenkai boosts, but Vegeta and Goku can't do it anymore due to hitting their limits. This doesn't mean their base forms can't get stronger through battle and training, it only refers to the Zenkai and their current limits. Like Goku in the Cell games, he was at his limit then, but seven years later in the Buu Saga, it doesn't invalidate his Cell Saga limits at the time. And plus, there are times when Goku's base does evidently grow from here. So I take this as just the Zenkai boost doesn't work anymore, or it's very, very minimal. So how is it possible for Goku Black to be stronger and keep getting Zenkais? Well, it's also stated Goku Black has the soul of a god and the body of a Saiyan. They are increasingly becoming one and the same. So in essence, the fact that Zamas is a god means the Saiyan Zenkai cap could be lifted to go along with this plot. He immediately overwhelms Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta, so at least 1.25 times. But Vegeta gets a Senzu and it does nothing and he's still overwhelmed at 1.25 times. Goku Black gets healed again, but was not severely damaged this time. He just states the more these damaged cells regenerate, the more they become his own control. So Goku Black gets stronger by lifting the Zenkai cap, as well as passively unlocking power. So in this case, it's reasonable to suggest the second heal raised his power by 1.25 times. And Super Saiyan Rose is an absolute monster of a form here. Completely squashes Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta. Applying the 1.6 billion multiplier onto Goku Black's new base form puts him at 81 sextillion in this power scale. And if you want to know how much stronger that is than Kid Buu versus Super Saiyan 3 Goku, divide it by 400 and we get 242 quintillion times stronger than Kid Buu versus Super Saiyan 3 Goku. It's ridiculous. 
During this battle, Goku Black states he has now mastered the power, at least in terms of progressive growth. And that stops here, unless he gets visible Zenkais. Now, Zamas takes on Super Saiyan 1 Goku, and he's able to freeze him. Now, he even admits he's not as strong as Goku, but gods have their own ways of fighting. Therefore, Zamas does not surpass Super Saiyan 1 Goku in raw power. This Zamas is clearly far stronger than the previously scaled Zamas in the main timeline. No explanation why, other than the plot again, but Super Saiyan Goku still dominates if it wasn't for the magical abilities. Goku and Vegeta then get overrun by Goku Black and retreat back to the past, and Trunks sucker punches Goku Black, but again, this doesn't equate to any visible power jumps for Trunks. As I said before, in Dragon Ball Super, if you're off guard or careless, you're vulnerable as someone with a power level of 1. And as proven, Goku Black pins Trunks down with no struggle. A day later, when Trunks returns to the battlefield and Goas is talking to Goku Black, Trunks encounters Zamas and says, If it's only you, I can at least stall you. This does not refer to power, but the fact Zamas is immortal and keeps coming back. Trunks is far stronger in raw power than Zamas at this point, but immortality is the deal breaker. This is proved later when Super Saiyan God Goku tells Zamas that he's much weaker than Trunks. So I give Trunks a 2 times domination multiplier over Zamas. And not only that, it's important to consider Supreme Kai was willing to stand up to Zamas confidently. Zamas still believes himself to be above Supreme Kai, and he is as momentarily he whips Supreme Kai into the dirt. So it's reasonable to put Zamas at 1.5 times Supreme Kai, but nevertheless a huge power jump for Supreme Kai as well. When Vegeta finishes his training in the time chamber and fights Goku Black, he switches to blue mid-fight against Goku Black to save stamina. It's still essentially Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta versus Goku Black, but with a twist. The blue power is able to overwhelm Goku Black, making Vegeta's time chamber training give him a 31,250,000 times raw power increase, in addition to a technique to conserve the blue power. Pretty incredible. Now, even though previously Trunks said that Goku and Vegeta had hit their limits and don't benefit from Zenkai boosts, that is true in terms of the Zenkai boost, but they still grow through training in the manga, as demonstrated here when Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta's power is now able to keep up with Super Saiyan Rose, which it previously couldn't. The multiplier for Blue didn't get stronger, Vegeta's base actually got stronger and better conditioned. Zamas sucker kicks Super Saiyan God Vegeta, but as I said, sneak attacks don't count towards anything anymore. All measurements and comparisons are done when both fighters are on guard and locked on each other. Now as the arc progresses, we get to God Zamas, or Merd Zamasu. This one has a frightening power in the manga. The consistent fusion multiplier I've used in the past and works well in conjunction with Dragon Ball lore and all of the fusion material combined is the best of A plus the best of B, then multiply that by 100 to get the resulting base fusion that appears. It worked for Vegito in Z, it works for Gotenks, it works for Kefler in the anime, it works for Gogeta, so this is the way I go. But because the mass is so low, it's essentially just Goku Black's power magnified. God Zamas is 80 times stronger than Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta. But when it comes to Super Saiyan Blue Goku, Goku is able to put a Kamehameha through God Zamas's guts. Now this one is a huge debate, because some argue Goku's Kamehameha was God Zamas levels, others think it was Zamas being careless with his guard down, and I agree with the latter due to this moment being portrayed as a surprise attack, Zamas's facial expressions also being surprised and was extremely arrogant and boasting to Goku whilst approaching him. So that was the intention. God Zamas is arrogant and lucky to have healing here, just proving that fights can be over in a heartbeat if someone lowers their guard, a fundamental lesson to Dragon Ball Super's battle history. But then, enter Vegito, or Vegerot? No, let's stick with Vegito, guys. What we learn from Super Saiyan Blue Vegito is that God Zamas can't even hurt this guy. Vegito is far beyond, to the point where this is nothing like the anime, where there's a crazy clash between the two. No, in the manga, Vegito is far, far beyond, more than the anime, to the point when he charges his final Kamehameha. Supreme Kai then questions if that power has exceeded Beerus. Now, from a narrative point of view, there is an intention with that dialogue. It's putting Vegito Blue's Kamehameha power and Beerus in the same ballpark at this moment in time during the Dragon Ball Super manga. In future arcs, Moro, etc., I'm not speaking for. I'm talking strictly about the Goku Black arc Beerus. But how strong is Super Saiyan Blue Vegito? First, we have to calculate the power of Goku because after fusion, it's stated Vegeta felt 
Kakarot's true power during the fusion. And if Vegeta can sense it, and Goku later clarified he's now going to show Zamas all he's got, then that means the power was available to Goku that went into the fusion power to begin with. The true power for Goku is completed Super Saiyan Blue at this point, and it's stated it is capable of fighting equally with Zamas, and demonstrates it in raw power and at times shows better skill. Zamas maintains the advantage due to the immortality and healing. So let's calculate completed Super Saiyan Blue Goku and Vegito Blue. Base Vegito is 101 times stronger than God Zamas. Regular Super Saiyan Blue Vegito is 161 billion times stronger than Merge Zamas. But it's reasonable to suggest, with the dialogue in this arc, that Beerus is around the level of the power of the final Kamehameha. And it was only mentioned when Vegito charged it up. A Kamehameha is a 2.2 times multiplier. A final flash is above a Gallic Gun, where a Gallic Gun is a 3. 4 has been reasonable in my Dragon Ball Z power scale, so 6.2 times for a final Kamehameha puts Beerus's raw power at 6.2 times Vegito Blue's combat power at 8.2 under Cillian. And if you want to know how strong these are compared to Kid Buu versus Super Saiyan 3 Goku, Super Saiyan Blue Vegito is 3.3 decillion times that, and Beerus's predicted power at this point in the Goku Black Arc is 20 decillion times stronger than Kid Buu versus Super Saiyan 3 Goku. A spine-chilling difference in power. <laughs> As the battle progresses, God Zamas becomes two God Zamas with the same power. Vegeta rages out and uses a Gamma Burst to blow the two away. Again, this is another surprise attack with Zamas looking surprised. Lowering his guard, being careless, arrogant, overconfident, relying on his healing ability. You know, all the qualifications for justifying vulnerability during certain moments. But either way, it's time to wrap up this arc. Zeno turns up and erases the entire world, potentially the entire 12 universes in the future, and remains afloat in the macrocosm of the timeline. And that's it for the future Trunks arc. Yes, it just suddenly ends like that, just like the story. What a ride, a completely broken arc that escalates the power in Dragon Ball Super to insane levels. Now it's time for the Tournament of Power Power Scale, and now I'm going to share with you the most broken arc in the Dragon Ball Super manga. Far more busted than the Goku Black arc, so please lend me a like towards the video. That really helps keep my spirits up to continue this wild adventure, but more importantly, it helps get this video out there to other fans like yourself. So subscribe if you enjoy this video, because I guarantee you will. Now when the arc begins, straight away Goku gets shot and hurt by a bullet and admits he's getting out of shape and needs to get back to training. So I'm going to lower his raw base power by 1.25 times here, just to go along with the plot. Don't take the bullet panel personal, guys. He's not using his full base power here. Here. Base powers can fluctuate from a power level of 5 up to the millions in a heartbeat. Now on Beerus' planet, Vegeta is training with Whis. It's been 9 months at most since the Goku Black arc because Bra is about to be born. Whis says Vegeta has gotten better and his moves are getting sharper, and even says Vegeta has grown as a warrior. Whis doesn't refer to power here, but a sharper punch means a more precise one, thus would be more lethal and makes a difference. So in essence, Vegeta's sharper skills makes him a stronger warrior overall. So I'm raising Vegeta's overall power stat by 1.25 times. Goku was stronger than Vegeta during the fight with Zamas, but that's because of the completed blue. Beerus challenges Vegeta and says it's been a few years. So Battle of Gods is between 3 to 5 years ago. Beerus squashes Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta, and Tanks completed Super Saiyan Blue. In the Goku Black arc, Beerus was calculated to be potentially 8.2 under Cillian in this power scale. At this point, that's still not certain. It could be far higher, but this fight definitely supports those high levels for Beerus. No chance for Vegeta. Beerus was just having fun in this fight, as stated by Whis. And it's funny that Beerus says it will take Vegeta a million years to become his rival at this rate. And think about it, at this rate, that's a lot of power for Vegeta in a few years since the Buu Saga. That's how strong strong Beerus is. Also, on a quick note, Vegeta says, I'm the one who will get to the top first. I'm sick of following after him. Kakarot. That's in regard to Whis talking about the autonomous movement, a new goal. Vegeta is currently stronger than Goku because Goku hasn't been training, but Vegeta is talking about getting to that new goal first and doing it before Kakarot. Vegeta also refers to himself and Kakarot as equals, but this is because they continuously overtake each other like in a tight race. They are equal for the most part, but not every second of every day because of how much they train, sometimes one slacks off. Right now, there's a difference in power as evidenced by Vegeta getting better, but Goku could still catch up and over taking a heartbeat if he needs to. That's the potential of these guys, and also the plot.
When we get to the Gods of Destruction Battle Royale, we get a lot of interest and dialogue to gauge the power, so I will do my best to make sense of it as best as possible. Quetella, the mouse, may have defeated Beerus at arm wrestling. Whether it was close or not, we don't know, but when it comes to an all-out god exhibition fight, Beerus and Quetella, Tom and Jerry, are the last two standing before the fight was called off. So in terms of combat power, I've got to put these two at a similar power. However, for the other Gods of Destruction, most fall beneath them, as Beerus was more than capable of showing power to handle multiple gods at the same time. Sidra is close to Beerus in raw power, though that's a special move that multiplies one's power, but overall Beerus is a superior power plus combatant, whereas Quetella is potentially the strongest raw power but not the best combatant, if that makes sense. All of their stats are in different places. Belmont plays dead for the majority of the fight, showcasing his style, but also hints he can't compete with Beerus head-on in power if he resorted to that, so I put Belmont a tier below Beerus. Quick note, I need to debunk those that think base Goku is god-level here because he didn't fall from Rumshi's move. According to Whis, Gods of Destruction should be barely standing at this point after Rumshi's technique, and base Goku is still on his feet. We never saw the gods fall anyway, so Whis' dialogue is more for dramatic effect, plus Goku who even says that the gods battle royale was too intense to comprehend and that his battle won't be anything like that, that he's not confident fighting a god of destruction. So no, base Goku being god of destruction level doesn't add up with the full context. Plus Goku was further away than the gods of destruction, so Rumshi's technique wears off the further it goes away. Yes, the Supreme Kai falls, but that's the Supreme Kai, not base Goku. Goku vs Topo is very interesting. Topo's energy is not able to be detected in his start and form. This doesn't mean his power is a certain level. It's because he's a God of Destruction candidate and gods have that divine presence. Even physically weak characters have divine presence. What we should take from this is his starting power totally overwhelms Super Saiyan 3 Goku. It doesn't one-shot Super Saiyan 3 Goku in any way. So 1.75 times Super Saiyan 3 Goku is fine here until both power up. Then Topo fights Super Saiyan God, but this is not Topo's true power because he soon sees Goku turn blue and is able to dodge him and kick him straight in the Dragon Balls to eliminate him. A major low blow, but the fact Topo had to resort to that desperate move tells me something about Goku's blue power. That it's above Topo and he took advantage of Goku's guard being down. Even admits he may have not won if he didn't shatter his balls. Now this God of Destruction, I don't know how to say his name. I-W-N-E. I won. I won. I won. He says this battle is already at the level of us gods. And this is when Goku is just Super Saiyan God. This is obviously referring to the fact both of them have divine god key now. Both are fighting like gods. It doesn't mean they are the same raw power as the Gods of Destruction. Otherwise, if Super Saiyan God Goku was at the same power as the Gods of Destruction, all he needs to do is turn blue and then leapfrog them. And we know that's not going to happen. But the major piece of information we have is about Jiren and how he scales to Belmod. The official translation actually refers to battle power. Topo flat out says Jiren is stronger than the Universe 11 God of Destruction Belmod in terms of battle power. Though the in terms of battle power does make it sound like Belmod may have an advantage in some other area. He is a god of destruction, and they potentially have some killer techniques and abilities to deal with stronger opponents. Think of this, Super Saiyan Blue Goku versus Hit in the Universe 6 tournament of the manga. Goku Blue is actually stated to be physically stronger than Hit, but if Hit were to be able to use his deadly techniques in that fight, he could still kill the physically stronger Goku. So I'm keeping it at that. Nice and simple for the manga. Jiren has more battle power than Belmod. So based on predictions of current Beerus' battle power after using the Super Saiyan Blue Vegito as a potential landmark, this this is what Beerus, Belmod, and Jiren are in terms of power at this point in the story. And it's currently the only gauge we have at this point until we scale up to Goku versus Jiren. So we will see where we're at when we get there. Hold this thought. So let's talk about Android 17. Goku encounters him in the manga. We only see Goku use Super Saiyan 3 against him, which doesn't provide us with enough information, only a small scuffle. Where 17 knocks Goku fly in and Goku still looks confident in fighting him. From the limited fight we got, it could be that 17 scales to Super Saiyan 3 Goku at this point if he's suppressed. But let's wait and see where we're at in the tournament of power itself. When you look at this number for 17, consider base Goku in the Buu Saga is a 1, and consider the insane plot power up that Android 17 has just by fighting some poachers for 10 years. Anything is possible in Dragon Ball Super. Over in Universe 6, Kaba engages with Cauliflower. Cauliflower whips base Kaba, but Super Saiyan Kaba whips Cauliflower. We don't know their power in numbers here. We need to wait for the tournament of power because we can gauge them against other fighters there. But one thing I want you to take note of, base Kale in the manga is insane. Able to remove an item from Super Saiyan Kaba without him knowing. Casually. Remember that. All we need to know is base Kale is the strongest here, then Super Saiyan Cauliflower, then Super Saiyan Kaba. 
In terms of Frieza, we don't know how the battle of negotiations went with him and Goku, as Frieza agreed to a deal more than being beaten into submission. Therefore, we will wait until the tournament of power to get a true gauge on Golden Frieza's power and the actual multiplier for the Golden form, finally. But it's hinted they are somewhat close at the moment, with Goku having an edge. We know he's caught up since Resurrection F's level of power through just image training and plot. But you will see the changes soon. Things change very quickly during the tournament of power itself. Now the tournament begins. One of the most noticeable implications of power is Master Roshi being above Krillin and Tien. This was during Frost's attack. Frost easily took out Krillin without him even having a chance. Tien used a tri-beam and Frost tanked it. However, Roshi was confident in telling Goku to let him handle it, and he's not that weak. We all know Roshi gets the ultimate plot power-up in this arc, but to be portrayed better than Tien and Krillin, I don't know what to say. Where were you in Dragon Ball Z, Roshi? Now we don't know how much stronger Frost has got since the Universe 6 tournament, but we do establish now that Frost is at his final form and doesn't know further power-ups in the manga. We also have evidence that many fighters including Hit have been getting stronger, so as a low ball we can increase Frost's strength by 1.25 times since the Universe 6 tournament. Tien and Krillin fall far below this. Master Roshi's base power is potentially much closer. Gohan takes on the Wolves. Remember, it's not the same as the anime by a long shot, and it's hard to gauge Gohan's suppressed power because he's constantly being double or triple teamed, but Frieza deals with two of them with two death beams. This is an off-guard moment, so again, this is an unreliable moment to gauge suppressed Gohan and Frieza. Now, Goku actually gets a plot power-up at the start of the tournament of power in the manga, Saiyan Battle Prowess, right? Because now, as a Super Saiyan 2, he takes on Topo and Dispo and holds ground for a little while. This is obviously a suppressed Topo, similar to what crushed Super Saiyan 3 Goku in the exhibition. Dispo was able to use his speed and overwhelm Goku somewhat, and Topo looks at ease. So Dispo and Topo's current power is 1.5 times Goku's each, but the fact Goku is doing better than what he was as a Super Saiyan 3 against Topo alone shows us that he's grown in this short amount of time. I'm also putting Dispo at roughly suppressed Topo right now. Things change soon, but Goku is currently 5.6 times stronger since the start of the Zen exhibition. Goku powers up to perfected blue and strikes at Jiren, and Jiren literally uses minimum effort to push Goku back. Jiren tanks a Kamehameha at point-blank range, putting him easily two times the Kamehameha to negate it. This is the most suppressed version of Jiren we see. Also, Hit is now similar levels to Super Saiyan Blue Goku due to them performing similar against Jiren. Hit does suck a kick Jiren, and as explained before, we don't count those. Now, Hit uses his time lag on Jiren, and because Jiren is slowed down, this would affect his overall power against Hit, or it would at least make Hit feel more powerful due to outspeed in Jiren. More speed equals more power, less speed equals less power in Jiren's case, and this is why Hit could suddenly budge and knock Jiren back. Now, Jiren stops holding back as much and speeds up in order to overcome this time lag, thus becoming less suppressed. So this is the first time we see Jiren up his game. Albeit a small dose, it's still something. When we get to Cauliflower vs Freezer, it's very confusing due to the fluctuating performances between them. We see Freezer toy around with base Cauliflower like it's nothing, then Cauliflower turns Super Saiyan, manages to hit Freezer back, then Freezer crushes her with some rocks, then she pushes him back with what looks like her version of a Kamehameha wave, where Freezer then looks ruffled. But for her to do that whilst he's in combat without him even being able to counter says something about Cauliflower's power. Yes, Cauliflower is indeed a prodigy just like Freezer, but he cannot tank Super Saiyan Cauliflower's brute power, and he compliments his Super Saiyan power, actually hoping he wouldn't have to resort to his golden form, which means Super Saiyan Cauliflower is actually starting to be troublesome for final form Freezer in the manga. She gains power really fast, or it could be they just write without caring about power scales. And that's the most likely outcome. But like I said, it's not so much we're trying to make sense of it, we're just simply counting it. Now he becomes Golden Freezer and begins tormenting Cauliflower. Freezer is definitely not serious fighting her year. But then Kale steps in, showing how much of a beast she is in base form, totally different from the anime, able to demonstrate some impressive speed that even takes Freezer by surprise. Here's where things get weird. Cauliflower gets a massive power boost through her anger. An enraged Cauliflower's blast connects with Golden Freezer thanks to Kale's distraction, but Freezer manages to deal with it after he resets himself. However, he could not tank it. He had to put in some energy to deal with it. This is very important to how far Cauliflower grew in her rage boost, and that's just another example of broken power scaling, as two minutes ago, she was getting pinned down by final form Freezer's rocks. 
Golden Frieza is 1.75 times Super Saiyan Cauliflower's Enraged Blast. Frieza says that Kale's attack stung a bit more than Cauliflower's, so it's reasonable to put base Kale at 1.25 times Super Saiyan Cauliflower. So that's how strong her base form is. If Super Saiyan Cauliflower's Blast just forced Golden Frieza to be serious with an explosive wave, then Kale could do even better if she tried. That's just how it is. Broken manga arc. As for Kaba, Super Saiyan Cauliflower used to be 1.75 times Super Saiyan Kaba, but now she's way higher. We don't get any proof of Kaba's growth here, but an extreme high ball, you could still put him 1.75 times less than Cauliflower, but it would be difficult proving that, as at this point there's no way to compare his power to anything. Now Kale becomes the legendary Super Saiyan. She tanks Frieza, slams him around with one arm like Hulk versus Loki. It's at this moment and from this encounter with Kale that Goku's power just conveniently powers up because Super Saiyan Blue Goku catches legendary Super Saiyan Kale's punch directly, smiles and takes her on initially, which is insane considering she just transformed. It just happened, so I'm counting it. Just another one of those power-ups with narrative busting the scale in. This isn't the first time and it won't be the last. Goku grows 13 times since the last point in this tournament. But then Kale's key spikes and she goes on the attack and Goku says she's getting stronger to the point she pressures him, breaks his block and is about to hammer him until Frieza kicks him out of the way. Kale's key then spikes for a second time where Goku and Frieza start crapping themselves. Kale attacks everyone and her key spikes for a third time. Three power-ups after transforming. On the third spike, she smiles and appears ready for destruction. So that's the one where she appears at full power during the slaughter. In terms of a multiplier for Kale, there's nothing official for her. We know she's a Super Saiyan, but it's also stated she's a different breed of Super Saiyan, which means she could be higher than a 50 times amp. But again, it's unknown, and I don't want to amplify the headcanon. So I will give her an initial 50 times amp for Super Saiyan, but then increase her 1.25 times every time her power spikes during combat, which was three times. So the legendary power is like a slow release power after initially transforming until it reaches a total of a 100 times multiplier from base form which is the same as Super Saiyan 2. And that's kind of cool because in classic Dragon Ball Z, legendary Super Saiyan Broly was always debated alongside Super Saiyan 2 Gohan. So this is poetic that the legendary amplifier is the same as Super Saiyan 2 here. The difference with Kale is that her base form is so damn strong that even a 100 times buff is overkill. Kale is Universe 6's Broly. Her base has every right to be this strong. After Kale destroys everyone, it's shown she's not able to control her power, and the only way to balance her out was by fusing with a stable Cauliflower that created a well-balanced fusion in Kefla. Kefla is the power of Kale harnessed with Cauliflower's attitude, and fusion is absolutely no joke, we all know that. When she's formed, we get a lot of power on our hands. The fusion multiplier we always use is best of A plus best of B, then multiply by 100. I won't apply a further controlled boost to the legendary Super Saiyan power, because nothing was stated about that in the manga, only in the anime. Me. And Gohan matches it. Apparently, he grew stronger than ever during this fight, according to Piccolo, which is strange. It's only been going on for 10 seconds. But I suppose at least we've got an inverse reason to this power. He did, in fact, train as stated in Chapter 28, the bonus chapter. Yes, Gohan continues to use the gravity chamber in secret. Dragon Ball Super Manga Gohan is no pushover. He always trains. And who does Gohan become if he trains? The answer, the best. I'm not even going to bother calculating his base. His ultimate power is too unstable in terms of a multiplier and is plot specific. In my Dragon Ball Z scale, the ultimate form was like a 20,000 times increase at that time, but that's obviously not going to work here in Super as that doesn't stay consistent with Dragon Ball Super power creeps. Even 20,000 times less power makes Gohan's base stronger than everyone we've calculated so far, which clearly isn't the case and we can't use 20,000 times anymore. Therefore, it's going to remain simply as two different Gohans. Gohan not full power, and Gohan full power, with his power fluctuating in between the two points depending on how serious he is. Ultimately, you could even consider his ultimate power, his ultimate form, being a stronger multiplier than what it was in the Buu Saga. Either way, it's one of the most broken power jumps in Dragon Ball history, and I think everyone is aware of that. Think about it, Goku started struggling against Kale, where Gohan handled the fusion of her, which stacked a legendary Super Saiyan multiplier on top of the base fusion. They write without thinking about scaling, only to tell a story. But when we take time to analyze their work, this is what happens. And this would make Gohan's full power now 
10,000 times stronger than Goku's Super Saiyan Blue perfected power. So what is that telling us about Ultra Instinct Sign or the Silver Head Ultra Instinct? You shaking already? This is going to break new grounds. Gohan may be the best up until this point, but when it comes to Goku time, oh, it's Goku time. <laughs> Goku then fights Jiren again and uses something with a similar principle to the Kaioken. The blue form's raw power increases in exchange for damage in his body. Kaioken or not, same principle. Nothing is stated in terms of a multiplier or which level Goku uses, so we can't just go sticking a times 20 on him without evidence in the manga. Therefore, a 2 times boost to Goku's power, a full domination amp, is the least head cannon we can go. The suppressed Jiren takes this Kaioken-like attack head-on, with only being slightly budged, showcasing that his suppressed power is still deeper than we realize. But this suppressed power is at least 1.75 times Kaioken Goku here. Jiren is literally a wall waiting for Goku to jump over. Roshi demonstrates the same principle as Ultra Instinct somewhat, to the point he can block and dodge suppressed Jiren. Roshi, even for his 5 seconds of fame, could have been absolutely anywhere in terms of these numbers, but never over suppressed Jiren. That's a fact. It's a temporary stunt, but it could very well be that Roshi was faster and more capable than Super Saiyan Blue Goku's Kaioken-like stunt here, even for just 5 seconds. Putting Roshi over 1 octillion times stronger than his Dragon Ball Z self, but only for 5 seconds. <laughs> Not funny. But yeah, Krill and Tien, Android 18, Piccolo, they're all very difficult to gauge in this tournament, as there's nothing suitable to bounce off. However, in the Moro arc, things are different, and there are ways there. But in terms of Ultra Instinct Sign, here we go. First time we see it, Goku is able to easily dodge and surprise Jiren at the start, but we see nothing else of it. It deactivates very quickly, but we know Jiren saw it as a threat. Now we finally get to Vegeta. Where have you been, Vegeta? He fights Topo. Both are very serious and fight each other all out. Later in this brawl, Vegeta even compliments Topo being stronger than he looks and that he has a lot of power left over which was giving Vegeta a tough time. To the point Vegeta even admits he's struggling against Topo and that's what causes him to ascend into the evolved blue form. So we know Topo and perfected blue Vegeta are somewhat equal. And before Goku got that huge power boost against Kale, Topo said that Vegeta's perfected blue was on par with Goku's then perfected blue, meaning Topo has gotten much stronger since the Zen exhibition in order to handle this power of Vegeta. Vegeta doesn't get any evidential power-ups like Goku did against Kale, which means only one thing for his blue evolution. The multiplier is insane. Vegeta evolves into what has a darker blue aura, essentially the manga version of Super Saiyan Blue Evolution, but with a twist. Whereas in the anime, the blue Kaioken boost and blue evolution are similar in power, in the manga events, blue evolved is above. Goku's Kaioken-like principal blue boost. Watch closely. He attacks Jiren, and Jiren gets cut and looks impressed, admitting Vegeta has fought harder than any besides Ultra Instinct Sign. Jiren is only referring to those who has fought him. This doesn't include Gohan vs. Kefla. So Blue Evolved is a tier above Goku's boosted Blue Kaioken-like power, and Jiren takes Blue Evolved attacks on the chin like a boss, and still wrecks Vegeta without any effort. So Jiren's currently known suppressed power is 1.5 times Blue Evolved Vegeta. The Evolved Blue form is 35 times from Perfected Blue, and the multiplier in itself is just shy of 4.3 trillion times from base form. Tell me that's not broken. This video title and thumbnail should have just been called Blue Evolved is Demonic. But no, sign is still yet to come. Prepare yourselves. <laughs> Frieza takes on the weakened Topo, and it's confirmed he is weakened now, where Topo can't even stand up. So I'm comfortably putting Topo at 1% power if he can't even stand up and was being carried by Dispo. Final form Frieza is recovered and is fresh, and is at least a tier above Topo and Dispo here. And this is where we can do our best to now gauge the golden Frieza multiplier, finally. This makes the golden multiplier a 57 times boost, so it's essentially a 50 times multiplier just like Super Saiyan, which works conceptually as the golden form was created created to mock the golden Super Saiyan form Frieza encountered on Namek. And it's also fine because we never see the fight in the Dragon Ball Super Resurrection F manga events in order to gauge final form Frieza. The golden form has been a mystery up until this point, and remember, it's not about the four multipliers, it's about the base power, which is far more important. Frieza fights Jiren, and is stated his power is nothing against him, but Android 17 steps in and is able to protect Frieza. So Android 17's true power is different to the island fight against Super Saiyan 3 Goku. That was his suppressed power. Power, but his true power is just as good as Golden Freezer here. That's how powerful Android 17 is. His explosion could be around a 5 times boost, but it still does nothing to Jiren, who simply wiped off the dirt. <laughs> Oh! <laughs>
Now, even though the principle of improving is different from simply powering up and gaining raw power, the outcome is always power. Whether it's through strength or speed, power is Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball is power. There are many ways to get more power, not always through the conventional means. And Ultra Instinct is another way. So that's why even with UI now, in this equation, we can still scale as usual. We're not focusing on how they are that strong by concept. We're simply looking at them just being that strong now because they just are. In the end, they are always more powerful. Now, Goku fires up to Ultra Instinct sign again, and Jiren responds with his first big noticeable power-up, the Red Aura. This power represents Jiren putting in a fair bit of effort and would attempt to rise to meet the level he sensed moments earlier with Sign. Sign is portrayed as the most exhilarating level of power this far in the tournament, meaning it's above Kefla and Gohan by a fair domination multiplier. Goku then powers up to the Silver Head Ultra Instinct. Jiren also spikes his energy again, soaring even higher, but Goku still wrecks him. Jiren's power spikes once again, and this time with Red Lightning. And for a moment, moment, Ultra Instinct Goku still bests him, but that's only when Goku is in peak condition. UI takes its toll on Goku, and then they start fighting equal for a while. It becomes a battle of attrition, as we says, but Jiren is eventually the last one standing because he has better conditioning, despite Goku initially being the strongest. So we know Jiren's highest power doesn't surpass UI Goku's highest power, which is why peak Ultra Instinct here is 1.25 times peak Jiren, but only for a little while. We also know Jiren is above Belmod in battle power which puts Jiren at similar levels to Beerus, but Ultra Instinct Goku at his best would be above Jiren and Beerus in the Dragon Ball Super manga, making Ultra Instinct Goku our highest ranked character in our manga scale so far, not including the Angels, Grand Priest, and the Omni King. Goku may be scaled higher than Beerus right now, that is, until future arcs say otherwise. And there's always a chance Beerus can get stronger off screen, but we will deal with that when we get to it. But also, it goes to show you how powerful Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta's final Kamehameha was in the future Trunks arc that was also at the level of Ultra Instinct Goku and Beerus' combat power. There's no point in calculating the final scuffle between Goku, Vegeta, and Jiren. They are all weakened and clearly stated so. It was blood and guts, a final push between all three. Nothing really important about it except it was all part of the finale to get Jiren eliminated in style. Here are the current multipliers right now in terms of transformations. In the last part of this power scale, the Super Saiyan Blue perfected multiplier from base form was 128 billion. Super Super Saiyan Blue Evolved is 4.3 trillion, Ultra Instinct Sign is 2 quadrillion, and then the Silver Head Ultra Instinct. <laughs> If you want to know the power of Ultra Instinct Goku in the manga tournament of power, from Kid Buu vs Super Saiyan 3 Goku in Dragon Ball Z, he's 25 decillion times stronger right now. Now you should know there is no killing in the Tournament of Power, which may make some believe these fights are not going all out, but when you look at the whole context of the battle, such as Ultra Instinct Goku vs Jiren, they are powering up with intention to defeat the opponent like nothing else matters. They are really trying, and it's stated they are going all out. Even Kao becoming the legendary Super Saiyan didn't give a damn about eliminating her own team member. Do you think she cared about killing? So although there's no killing, there's going to be no nerfs in the showcases of their raw power during this tournament because they all still clash with each each other and a state to be going all out. But you could apply head cannon and give all of my numbers a 1.25 times boost and say that's their power if they're trying to kill someone. <laughs> Now I need to explain to you the anime and movie continuity to Dragon Ball. You should all know by now that the Dragon Ball franchise has multiple continuities, multiple timelines, even for modern Dragon Ball. It's officially stated in V-Jump by Akio Iyoku, the Dragon Ball room head of Shueisha, that Dragon Ball, even Super, has multiple timelines, the anime and the manga, where similar main plot points happen, but how they are told, it's different. Another continuity is the Battle of Gods and Resurrection F Dragon Ball Z movies, as those events differ from the super anime and the super manga. During the Resurrection F arc, it's only briefly mentioned in the manga with limited information. Even though the main plot points of Resurrection F happened, they are all canon, or the correct word, canonical, to their respective continuity. That's how the fan term canon actually works. There is no definitive one canon. Dragon Ball is a franchise, not just a manga. Toriyama is just one slice of the cake. The Resurrection F arc in the Dragon Ball Z movie had Saiyan Beyond 
Beyond God and already had a promotional Dragon Ball Z manga for it, which was an incomplete promotional manga. The Resurrection of F movie was also stated to be the sequel to the Battle of Gods movie. The Battle of Gods movie is officially stated to be based on the 6, 10, 15 scale by Toriyama. The Dragon Ball Super manga does not abide by that scale and Goku does not absorb any god key in the Dragon Ball Super manga. If you apply the Resurrection F movie to the Dragon Ball Super manga, you also have to apply the Battle of Gods movie as well, where the Super manga already has its own version of that. Similar main plot points, but told differently. We also can't just slot in the anime power scaling into the manga events. So for example, taking the Resurrection F movie power scale or the Broly movie power scale and slotting it into the manga power scale. It invalidates all the numbers you've previously done as there are different scales going into the movies, in the movie, and coming out of the movie compared to the manga power scale. There is also a Dragon Ball Super Broly light novel and it's an adaptation of the movie written by Masatoshi Husakaba, I believe that's how you say their name. And it's also illustrated by Akira Toriyama. There are some differences in the light novel to the movie, which again proves there are different continuities, different versions of the same main plot points and events. There's not one version that fits all continuities. But again, it is not the manga. You can't just pull this into the manga because this is based on the Broly movie. And on a quick note, in V-Jump, it also shows the Dragon Ball Super manga events. On the right of the manga, Battle of God's Ark is the Dragon Ball Z Resurrection F movie, and it recommends to watch that to get an understanding of the main plot points. That doesn't mean the exact Resurrection F anime events are in the manga continuity, they aren't. It's just an event placement with the main plot points to help fill in a non-strict timeline as Akio Ioku officially stated. The movie without a doubt branches from the anime Tournament of Power, but the movie can be used as a bridge for the manga of Super, where it's also recommended in the same V-Jump as before to watch the Broly movie in between the manga Tournament of Power and the Moro arc. That's narratively speaking though, but again, it's still not the exact manga continuity. It means we would have to count all of the anime battles not seen in the manga, like Super Saiyan God Vegeta vs Broly, Golden Freezer vs Broly, as well as all the anime dialogue, like Broly being probably stronger than Beerus, that was never said in the manga. We also never see Broly's Akari form in the manga. We don't see the difference between his Super Saiyan Akari or legendary form in the manga. We simply have base Broly and then a Super Saiyan with no pupils, just like Kale. So even though the main plot points take place in the manga, we don't have 100% manga proof of those events happening exactly as they did in the anime Broly movie. Word for word, scene for scene, punch for punch. When it comes to the Broly events portrayed in the manga continuity, some time has passed after the Tournament of Power. We get some panels showing where the events of Broly took place and the key dialogue, Goku and Vegeta emerge from those events stronger than ever. We also get panels in the Slice of Life that showcase Vegeta and Goku have been training together ever since the Tournament of Power. So there's a fair bit of arc to arc power-ups we need to apply first. It's portrayed Vegeta and Goku's base forms are level once again at the start of the Moro arc. That's the traditional thing that happens in the Dragon Ball Super manga, is that one of them is way ahead by the end of an arc only for the next arc to level out their base forms. But then I will also apply a 1.25 times training growth boost during the time span between the Tournament of Power and the Broly events. And then I will also apply another boost for the Broly events power up where they emerged from the events stronger than ever. So let's calculate that. Let's fast forward a few more chapters in the manga to pull up additional panels for the Broly events where Goku reveals that he and Vegeta merged and somehow beat Broly. Now, think about what somehow means. That implies almost a lucky outcome. That implies that Broly was a formidable opponent, even for Gogeta Blue, and they beat him in what sounded like a very close battle, which is totally different from the anime movie events. They didn't somehow beat Broly in the movie. They blitzed him. And by the way, I checked with Herms98, and he confirmed somehow we won is a direct translation. There is no second guessing. So you see, that's why we can't fully apply the movie to the manga, because there are some differences that count. Somehow doesn't refer to Goku and Vegeta forgetting what happened when they fused and how they beat Broly. Fusion parts retain the memories of their battle when they're fused. It's been stated multiple times in multiple fusions. Here is proof right here that Goten and Trunks retain all the information from when they are fused. The transformation, the plan, details such as time limits to the point they even intend on remembering what they're talking about individually for when they become Gotenks. So there's absolutely no way Goku and Vegeta would be oblivious in how they beat Broly. Somehow refers to it being some kind of miracle. 
Now, for Super Saiyan Blue, Gogeta to somehow beat Broly, I put Gogeta at most a tier above Manga Broly. That being 1.25 times, Manga Broly is an actual killing machine that would eat Jiren for breakfast and is actually, at this point, the strongest mortal fighter except for... Gogeta Blue. Let's calculate Gogeta's power. For this, we will use Goku's base of six quadrillion. In the manga-only panels, it mentions Goku and Vegeta using their Super Saiyan Blue forms. I have to go with Perfected for both of these due to what we see in the manga panels. They don't have the aura, and there's also no evidence of Blue Evolved. Now, with the Fusion Multiplayer I use, which is a midpoint of using all official Fusion sources, it's the best of A plus the best of B, then times that by 100. And let me tell you why I include Ultra Instinct into Goku's best of A. It's because the power although it cannot be activated at will at this point, is still a power deep within Goku until it gets activated. So that potential goes into Gogeta to create the base fusion part. And this is why Gogeta is so goddamn strong after the tournament of power. Gogeta doesn't appear to be blue evolved. There's no aura around him or during his Kamehameha, so perfected is the most reliable answer during the final moments. Could Gogeta have gone blue evolved to make it an easier fight? I would say yes, but why didn't they? Well, that's just how it's written. But if you want a reason, maybe the fusion would have broken if they generated too much power, similar to Vegito at the time. So Gogeta sticking to perfected blue instead of blue evolved could have been a valid reason to secure staying as Gogeta to fight Broly. These two characters will probably be the top levels of power for a while, and may be unbeaten during the Moro arc, but we will see when we get there. Perhaps there is one who could top it. But how does Broly's power work, and how does it evolve? Well, he is the parallel to Kale, where both their base forms are extremely high, and once they transform, their power keeps rising. But yeah, let that base form power haunt your sleep. Never underestimate Manga Broly. No wonder we don't see him often. If someone thinks somehow we won doesn't signify there being great difficulty, then maybe that person will sleep at night in a duvet of lies. And this is another reason why there's no way I can apply a scale from the movie itself. When it comes to the manga, it will always say somehow they won. The manga material will always override the anime in a manga-only series. Broly grew in base power before he became a Super Saiyan, and the moment Broly transformed, Goku and Vegeta's Super Saiyan Blue perfected forms couldn't beat him. We also know, through Kale, that once transformed, Broly's power continues to spike to different levels. So let's work out his maximum base, then Super Saiyan, and we can work out the rest that spikes up to around Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta levels. We know Goku couldn't activate UI at will, so that idea was out of the window, which which means Goku could only resort to his Kaioken-like stunt like he did against Jiren, but because he says we had to perform fusion means that the Kaioken-like stunt would not have mattered. So Broly's Super Saiyan form is above that, and it is also above a potential Vegeta Blue evolved form due to the fact Goku is basically implying that fusion is the only option. They had to do it. But base Broly also had to be a level where Goku and Vegeta could not easily finish him before he transformed, thus making Broly's base form close to those two in perfected blue in order to not get squashed by them. So I put base Broly a tier or two below Goku and Vegeta's combined perfected Super Saiyan Blue tag team, then multiply that by 50 for the initial Super Saiyan amp before the continuous key spikes. So these power spikes after he turned Super Saiyan would take him from 50 octillion to 100 quindecillion. That's absolutely absolutely insane. Considering the power spikes were too much for Kale, Broly on the other hand goes even further than his Universe 6 counterpart. Why might you ask? Well, from a narrative and marketing point of view, it's friggin' Broly. But in verse lore, you could say being nearly 50 years old, living on Vampa his whole life, he's never had legendary sex or needs to unleash a lot of legendary aggression. To work out how much stronger Manga Broly's highest power is compared to Kid Buu vs Super Saiyan 3 Goku, just divide the scaling number we have by 400 times, as that's the Super Saiyan 3 multiplier, because base Goku in the Buu Saga is a 1 in this scale. And we get Manga Broly, 250 quattro decillion times stronger than Kid Buu and Super Saiyan 3 Goku in the Buu Saga. Super Saiyan Blue perfected Gogeta would be 320 quattro decillion times stronger. And Broly grew two sextillion times stronger in the battle with Gogeta after he turned into a Super Saiyan. Now that's what I call a legendary Super Saiyan and would have kept growing until Gogeta stopped him. That's damn right horrifying. 
but also hilarious because two sextillion times is also the Ultra Instinct multiplier in this scale. So in my manga scale, even if Goku used Ultra Instinct, he couldn't have beat Broly due to the skyrocket in power, where even Gogeta couldn't prevent Broly from growing that amount that he did. It's the giant raw power surges of Broly that make him scary, not so much the initial form multiplier. At the end of these events, it's stated Goku and Vegeta emerged stronger than ever, so I will apply another rough 1.25 times boost to their base powers, as that's the lowest head cannon I can go. But that's only the power amp after emerging from the event stronger than ever, because after Broly, at the start of the Moro arc, we soon see Goku and Vegeta continue to train hard, which is the final power up I will apply in preparation for the Moro arc in the next part. So overall, this is why manga Broly is absolutely terrible and frightening in terms of his power. The Super Saiyan transformation just opens the door because when he's in that form that's when the true power surfaces i wonder how strong he will be the next time we see him in the manga Moro is a complex villain to measure in a raw power scale because he also uses magic combined with raw power to enhance his threat level. What you must notice is that even after Moro wishes for his full magic to be returned, he still continues to grow in physical prowess by absorbing energy from planets and people. How this is shown is through the slow removal of his beard to his clean-shaven self, as he's portrayed 10 million years before in his prime. That clean-shaven Moro has peak magic and peak physical prowess. So for my interpretation, I give Moro two readings, raw power and then magic amplified. Think of his magic like a multiplier technique to his overall power, where the resulting scaling number is the equivalent threat level to someone who has that raw power number. But ultimately in Dragon Ball, the end result is always power, no matter the difference in fighter styles. At the start of the arc, we see Goku and Vegeta continue to train with each other, so as explained before, their power is at 10 quadrillion at the start of the arc. Soon after, Goku and Vegeta embark on an adventure to stop Moro. Goku senses Moro for the first time and states his chi wasn't huge, but terrifying, how it represents a mass of slaughtered souls and planets. Vegeta also refers to his energy as ominous. It's not stronger than Vegeta, just Sinister and Doomy. And it's not God Key. And remember, this is Moro, as he says, in his most pathetic state. During Moro vs. Vegeta on planet Namek, Moro uses energy of the planet to attack with special moves. So those attacks aren't really the conventional raw power as such, but his power is still strong enough to summon such moves and wield it. It's an unorthodox style of power. But from what we gather, we know Moro's raw power exceeds Super Saiyan Vegeta, but without magic, he cannot defeat Super Saiyan God Vegeta. Throughout the years, Moro has begun to regain his power, so he's not the puppy dog he was when the Great Lord of Lords sealed him away. When Moro absorbs energy, it improves his physical prowess. He's the planet eater after all, right? But he still requires the wish to regain his magic later on. Vegeta as Super Saiyan Blue evolved against Moro, but Moro absorbs the energy of Namek and it's confirmed he is strong to the point Vegeta feels like he needs to hurry. But what you should know is Moro also absorbed the power of Goku and Vegeta throughout the fight, which actually makes Super Saiyan Blue evolved Vegeta look less impressive against him due to the transfer of energy without the Saiyans knowing. To the point he says he took quite a healthy portion of his power, and Vegeta said he can't even turn Super Saiyan, and Goku says he's totally drained, so Moro gets quite a nasty passive power up here, where we can apply almost all of Super Saiyan Blue Evolved Vegeta's power, plus base Goku's power, as those were the current powers being utilized during Moro's absorption. I would say 99% of the power, but that's like topo levels in the tournament of power where he couldn't even stand up, so I'll go with a 90% absorption rate. And for reference, right now Moro's magic gives him a 1.5 times amp whenever he uses it. That's his magic multiplier to his performance right now. It does get a lot higher when he gets the wish. The next part is extremely inconsistent because Goku and Vegeta have stated they have absolutely nothing left, not even enough for Goku to use instant transmission. So think about that as Moro sucks them both dry and says, incredible that the energy from a mere pair of beings could restore my body to this extent. Now for me, I see this as him not absorbing Goku and Vegeta's raw combat power, but their actual life energy, what they need to survive, their Genki, which is far more potent to Moro's body upon transfer. You know, like when Tien uses the Tri-Beam against Cell and sacrifices his life energy to go beyond. That deep reserve pool of energy to live, basically. And Goku and Vegeta state to die shortly. That juicy energy is like the meat right on the bone. The best part. 
So because Moro sucked that dry from Goku and Vegeta, I will apply a rough tier boost to go along with his stronger physical prowess and look. Moro says Goku and Vegeta's lives no longer concern him, and rightfully so, his power is above both of them combined. <laughs> A few days pass and we get to see Namekian fusion in full power. Now let's calculate the Namekian savior just for fun. We see him merge with six other Namekians, but it's made to sound like a lot more. So let's say 20 Namekians merged. I can't remember the exact Namekian merging multiplier, but let's go with a 10 times amp. Let's hype all the hell out of the first Namekian and put him as a one on this scale, the lowest we can, which is the same as Buu Saga base Goku, which is highly unlikely by the way, but anything's possible in Dragon Ball Super. It would make the final Namekian warrior at 100 quintillion. This is just a rough guess because I can't see the first Namekian alone being above Buu Saga base Goku, and this is going with the merger being a 10 times boost each time. But even 100 quintillion is still a massive power, and just falls short of Final Form Freezer in the manga Tournament of Power. A pretty poetic character comparison for the Namek arc, right? Still, it's nothing compared to Moro. Goku and Vegeta confirm Moro is even stronger than when they fought. They didn't feel his power increase after he absorbed their last life essence, so I won't increase it here again. Now let's talk about the Fat Margin Boo. Now, I thought Broly and Ultima Gohan were busted power jumps for plot convenience, but Fat Boo is up there. Just from having his memories unlocked, he's able to stomp a mud hole in Moro. Boo is so strong, he calls Moro a little weakling, which is one of the funniest bits of dialogue in the franchise. He's talking to Moro of all villains like this. Now, if you think about Boo's power in the Boo saga, Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs. Kid Boo were around 400. The good Boo falls below those two. So even if we went with 300 for the good Boo in the Boo saga, Boo is now in the octillions. This is a 300 septillion times boost from remembering past events and sleeping. Think about it. This is Dragon Ball Super, ladies and gentlemen. We don't get paid enough to make sense of bad writing. Just accept it and move on. Moro's magic power cannot affect Boo, but Boo is overwhelming Moro, so I put Boo at least 1.25 times Moro's current full capabilities. And in case you're wondering how the hell Boo managed to absorb the Great Lord of Lords years ago, it's because after using up all of his god power, the Great Lord of Lords easily dropped to around 400 in this scale. That's how much god power he lost. Also, the Fat Boo has been given wonderful plot power-ups in Dragon Ball Super, so his body is a different build right now. Moro gets his wish to regain his full magic power. Boo states it's different from pure strength, so this is where I increase the magic buff multiplier from 1.5 times to a higher number, which I will explain in just a moment. Moro laughs at the Great Lord of Lords' futile attempts to hurt him, so even though his raw power didn't increase, his magic is so strong now that the Great Lord of Lords gets affected by Moro. Moro says the Great Lord's power is unimpressive, comparing it to 10 million years ago. He can't unleash the sealing spell without the god power. Now, Boo's body has a lot of raw power, but he cannot unleash the spell. It needs god key in the mix as part of the type of key for the technique. It even implies the god power that went into Kid Boo would have been sufficient in this circumstance, and we know that was only a single drop of god power remaining after the Great Lord of Lords used the rest of it to seal Moro away. So it's not how much god power he needs for the spell, it's just that he needs a bit of it for the spell ingredients. And Fat Boo has no god power. God power doesn't always make you stronger. Think of Dende. God power just makes you more divine and allows you some other special perks but you can get stronger with it. Moro currently has the same magic as 10 million years ago, but he's not peak physical prowess due to still having that damn beard. Yes, he was nerfed pretty bad from the sealing technique. Now, out of nowhere, Goku and Vegeta confirm that with magic aside, they are stronger fighters and can beat Moro one-on-one -on -one at full power in Super Saiyan Blue. Vegeta is referring to his full power as in not drained by magic, and he said both of them alone could beat Moro, so that means perfected blue for Goku. So plot now requires Goku and Vegeta to have a stronger power in order to state this, despite Moro growing evidently stronger in this arc. This is what I warned you about with inconsistent writing. They don't care about scaling, yet will show moments when powers are altered. Things just happen. This makes Goku and Vegeta now both 40 times stronger than before, but if you want an inverse reason, they almost died from Moro absorption. So let's reactivate the Zenkai boost exploitation because it's Namek after all. Whatever you want. Goku and Vegeta's perfected blue powers are 1.25 times stronger than Moro's raw power, but if we're accounting Moro's magic buff, it should be strong enough to deal with Blue Evolved easily at a two times domination multiplier because Vegeta has no hope alone against Moro and his magic. This makes Moro at 4 nonillion after his new magic multiplier rises from 1.5 times to 100 times after the wish.
But the nightmare doesn't stop there because Moro then does the unthinkable and absorbs Goku and Vegeta again. This time sucking the life from their Super Saiyan Blue perfected forms until they can't even turn Super Saiyan. A 90% absorption success rate is being quite kind here, but regardless, Moro's raw power gets even goddamn stronger from the extra buff. But the nightmares don't stop there, because then he absorbs the rest of Namek until it's a wasteland. Another tier increase, and this is where Moro finally hits his peak physical prowess, confirming his completed physical recovery. This is the Moro from 10 million years ago. He finally reached peak, and the beard is gone. And remember, this was after he regained his full magic. So I believe I've done the reasonable thing in splitting up his raw power and magic power. Which means we can work out the power of the Great Lord of Lords from all those years ago. In their original fight, Moro was easily overwhelming the Great Lord of Lords, so I initially have him at 1.5 times stronger. But when he consumes the planet, Moro becomes stronger to the point he can dominate the Great Lord of Lords, forcing him to use the ceiling technique. So that's why energy absorbing gives him that tier boost of 1.25 times. As it said, if he absorbs another, they will be powerless, so it would be reasonable to put him in tanking ranges after that one. Before Moro was sealed, he was 1.75 times stronger. If the Grand Supreme Kai's power is roughly 12 nonillion, even if we stuck that onto Fat Boo right now, it still wouldn't be enough to stop Moro Prime. But he could seal him again if he had the god power. But Moro has earned it, and is now in full control. If you don't believe his power should be this high, think again. It's beat Gohan, Kefla, and UI Sign in the Tournament of Power. This is more than believable. This Moro could defeat everyone in the Tournament of Power, except for full power Ultra Instinct Goku and Jiren. But more importantly, the greatest power on the good guys team right now in this arc is Super Saiyan Blue Evolved for Vegeta at 2 nonillion. A lot of people forget or ignore this, but he carries the duo due to Goku not being able to tap into Ultra Instinct and Goku only having Super Saiyan Blue perfected right now. Of course, we're not counting Gohan in the good guys team yet, guys. If Gohan was on Namek, he could be making a difference and could have punched Moro's beard down his throat. Moro the beard eater. But you know how it goes, guys. Gohan's studying bugs in that, right? We continue the Moro arc after Goku, Vegeta, and Majin Buu retreat for their lives. Moro's plan is to continue consuming planet after planet. In terms of how many he consumes, it's later revealed by him to be countless planets. But we do see about five or six planets get consumed as a demonstration of what he is doing in that time. Bearing in mind, this would be around two months of consuming planets before the big battle on Earth. So just hold that thought as to how ridiculously stronger he gets. As evidence of his growth, it's stated multiple times, Moro is getting stronger during this time. And today you will also see why the power of Ultimate Gohan in the Moro arc, and why the Elder Kai unlock ability is repulsive. And by that, I mean nasty and unpleasant. It's extremely powerful. Unbelievable. <laughs> Meris agrees to train Goku in helping him master Ultra Instinct. Meris says that he will unleash his full power in training whilst within a room of spirit and time. But it's later revealed by Whis he had only been training Goku and not used any angelic abilities. Where Whis later steps in right before Meris wasn't about to hold back. So we know Goku didn't get a full angel potential to train against. As for Vegeta, he's training on Yardrat to control his spirit, which also grants a significant boost in power, which will be revealed shortly. On Earth, trouble is brewing. We learn that the criminal known as OG73I has an ability to steal powers from others for up to 30 minutes by grabbing their neck. If he doesn't use them, it's stored in his data bank. Jaco says 73 is already strong, but the copies give him an extra boost. That the copy data is just as strong as the copy person. Punches, kicks, blasts, power. There is no difference. The big difference is OG73I has unlimited stamina, so this naturally gives him the advantage over the copied individual, unless they have unlimited stamina too, which in Piccolo's case, he doesn't. So 7-3 arrives on Earth and beats down Piccolo with a clear stamina advantage. However, Gohan shows up and annihilates 7-3, clearly showcasing Gohan is way above Piccolo. This Gohan is amazing, as said before, if he was on Namek previously, he could have ended this whole Moro arc. And now he's even stronger than when he was in the Tournament of Power. Gohan's last known power was 7.5 nonillion in the Tournament of Power. Gohan's power can easily get a tier boost since the Tournament of Power, as we know he doesn't slack off training here in the manga. This pushes 7-3 to activate the data of Moro he stores 
Brotherhood in order to fight back against Gohan. That's right, you need a power of Moro Prime to deal with Gohan. This data of Moro is Moro Prime and would reasonably be the version of Moro Prime that we saw leave planet Namek where that's where he met OG-73i. Moro wants to rule so there's no way he would absorb a ton of planets and then give OG-73i the strongest version of himself. It's likely to be the one that left Namek where Moro then knew he would start consuming more planets on his own part to exceed the copy data just to maintain top villain dominance. Moro Prime and the copy data of him is 20 nanillion. Either way, whilst using Moro's abilities, 7-3 absorbs Gohan's Kamehameha. 7-3 utilizes Moro's abilities to aid his own body as well. This is how 7-3 has grown stronger over the years. Yes, the special abilities wear off, but if there's any extra power he gains whilst using those abilities, such as absorptions, those power boosts remain with him. It's stated he became a powerhouse over the years, so this works. So after 7-3 deactivates Moro's abilities, his raw baseline power would be that of Gohan's Kamehameha energy, that being 2.2 times Gohan for the Kamehameha amp. So even though 7-3 switches off Moro's abilities, his raw body is just that strong now. I've done this in previous scales with Z and the androids, and also with GT and Super 17, where if they absorb an attack, they acquire the power level of that attack, because that's how attacks work. Their power level rises, and they launch that power level in an attack form towards the opponent. The reason why Gohan isn't depleted after using this power is because stamina is a factor on why power works and restores during a fight. 7-3 goes to absorb Gohan's power even more, but he does not consume it, he just fizzles it out because Moro wanted him to withdraw. As for Piccolo, we don't know any last known power due to the fact there was nothing to gauge him off in the manga tournament of power, but in this arc, we will find something to gauge him off. 7-3's power is tricky to understand due to the change in him power. I see his raw baseline power staying with him, which means whatever data he switches to won't put him less than the raw base power he has on his own. But if there's two data, for example Gohan and Piccolo, when he switches from Gohan to Piccolo, his copy data power will decrease from Gohan to Piccolo, but never below OG-73's own baseline power, if that makes sense. So here his baseline is 20 nanillion. If he switches to Moro Prime's data, he will also get access to the Magic Amp, which amplifies the power already there. So 100 times, in this case for Moro's Magic Amp, put in OG-73's maximum capabilities currently at 2 decillion, for less than 30 minutes though. Moro definitely risked everything given OG-73 access to his powers. But Moro would be presumed to be even higher than this by the time of the next battle. Moro decides to wait for Goku and Vegeta to arrive so he can have a bigger feast. That is the reason, believe it or not. So this is where those two months pass whilst the Z fighters prepare for the battle and it's implied they trained in preparation. After two months, Gohan and the others get even more unbelievable in power. 7-3 turns back up for round two. Gohan and Piccolo expect 7-3 to copy them, where they would then use teamwork as an advantage to stop him. The goons also think that Gohan and Piccolo's training had gone to waste because it's been copied. So this would mean 7-3 found it necessary to take this new power that exceeds his current baseline power upon leaving previously. So if 7-3 was 20 nonillion upon leaving before, this would mean both Gohan and Piccolo have surpassed that limitation in the last two months of training. Otherwise, why would 7-3 even bother to copy Piccolo if he doesn't need that boost or advantage from Piccolo's power? Now, he could switch to Moro's data and crush everyone, but it's been said multiple times in the story and by Moro himself for 7-3 to conserve that data and not just go and use it. So this ties in with him trying to beat Gohan and Piccolo without using the Moro data initially. Ultimate Gohan has grown nearly five times stronger in the last two months and Piccolo has become even more of a monster than his previous self. So I place him a tier above 7-3's initial power, but then I put Gohan as two times Piccolo because Gohan could comfortably use his key to negate a special beam cannon on the levels of Piccolo's power. And it's officially stated in the Daisenshu that in order to negate an attack, you need to emit power two times stronger than the opponent. So if the special beam cannon's multiplier is around three to four times of a boost like in the Saiyan Saga, Gohan could negate it comfortably. The reason I say Piccolo equals 7-3 is because Gohan's barrier didn't really 
do the pushing in the beam struggle. It was Piccolo's own attack that pushed back the most, with Gohan's only giving him a small edge to overpower the equal opponent. But 7-3 then switches to ultimate Gohan, now putting him at 50 nonillion. But Gohan and Piccolo manage to defeat him with teamwork. 7-3 switches to his copied Moro abilities, and now Gohan and Piccolo are in trouble. All I'm going to say is if you think Piccolo is busted from the power creep here, wait until you see Android 17. Android 17 is able to dominate the Moro data of 7-3 and was on the verge of beating him. 17's power can't be absorbed, but Moro's magic is not just an absorption, it's a performance enhancement and Android 17 overwhelms it more than easily. So I put in 1.5 times 7-3's power with Moro's magic amp, making Android 17 a monstrous 3 decillion in power. Android 18 is a mysterious one because she shows up and appears to be on equal performance with 17, but as we know in the past, 17 scaled much higher than her, so there's not enough solid proof she's equal to him here. She could be higher than Piccolo and Gohan here, but it's unknown as she's only taken on a grunt. Remember, there's guys like Krillin, Tien, Yamcha, and Roshi on the battlefield, but that doesn't mean they are all ultimate Gohan levels for just being there. There's no way to gauge and measure them properly, so I won't put any numbers on them, but remember, anything is possible in Dragon Ball Super, and Android 17 is the perfect example of this, crushing OG 73i who has Moro's Magic Amp data. So when Moro arrives, it's stated he's on another level. Moro powers up Sagambo and this guy can wreck everyone effortlessly. He's able to tank them all, including Android 17. So I put him at least six decillion after being juiced up only once. Goku senses Krillin of all people's power to teleport to Earth. I can't really say anything about this except for the sheer stupidity of Goku not being able to feel Ultimate Gohan's power, but he can feel Krillin's smaller power. It's just stupid, bad, and inconsistent. Otherwise, we're saying Krillin's key spiked higher than Ultimate Gohan's here, guys. Guess the inverse reason is that Gohan's beaten up body was so bad that his key went lower than Krillin's, right? But if you want an Ultimate Gohan level Krillin, use this to laugh at your friends. Oh well, moving on. Goku arrives and Moro powers up Saganbo multiple times more and he explodes from the overload and this was after he decimated Android 17 and everyone else. But Super Saiyan Blue perfected Goku is able to completely dominate him where even before his explosion he still wasn't Goku levels. So I put Goku 1.75 times Saganbo's best whilst they were in combat. Moro Prime is able to hand off Super Saiyan Blue Goku from behind like he was an annoying fly. So this Moro is far above Super Saiyan Blue Goku. Moro says Sagambo couldn't even withstand that smidgen of energy that Moro gave him. So we will measure Moro very shortly and we need to see his fight with Ultra Instinct signed first. But Goku's training with Maris made his base form grow 340,000 times stronger. And if you think that's insane, wait until you see Vegeta's. One thing you should know about Goku versus Moro is that a stamina conserving Ultra Instinct sign fights Moro in a generally close battle. Goku having a slight edge in speed, but Moro powers up to full and Goku utilizes the maximum power of his Ultra Instinct sign. And this is where Moro's true power is shown to be above Ultra Instinct sign. They start off similar but Goku loses an edge due to the energy instability of the UI sign. To the point Goku even tries to do that Kaioken-like stunt, which he did in the Tournament of Power, here combining a possible 2 times amp to which Moro takes on the chin and responds with an angry mouth blast. So this is where Moro's power now lies, after absorbing planet after planet after planet. Over the months, and plot and power creeps obviously, Moro and UI sign right now blitz every known power in the Tournament of Power, including Jiren and the silver-haired UI back then. <laughs> Honorable mention to Super Saiyan Blue evolved Vegeta after his Yardrat training. An absolute powerhouse and he's not even Ultra Instinct. Super Saiyan Blue evolved Vegeta takes on Moro where Moro initially receives a big punch from Vegeta. So right at the beginning of their battle, Moro is around 1.75 times after being punched off his spot and grinding through the ground. He even braces for impact, which is complementary to Vegeta's raw strength now. From here on, the gap shrinks and then favors Vegeta due to the spirit fission. Remember when I said the power creep for Goku was over 300,000 times stronger after training with Meris? Well, Vegeta has grown around 90 million times stronger from training with the people of Yadrat. Vegeta's base over 250 times stronger than base Goku until obviously the next arcs where they get reset once again in typical Dragon Ball Super fashion. And Goku had triple the time in the time chamber for training compared to Vegeta. You want a prodigy? 
trilogy, that's it right there. Vegeta. Shameless Ark didn't have Vegeta be the one to defeat the old goat Moro, because everything from here screams perfect cell. And it all starts with Moro eating OG73. Yes, Eaton. It's stating Moro's power goes back to normal. No, bigger than ever. Because of Goku's initial assessment of Moro's energy being initially close to the original reading it once was, I have to go with Moro being 1.25 times stronger than before after Goku reassessed. From here, I'm not splitting Moro's power up between raw power versus magic power anymore. He's just going to be one solid power because he essentially now gets portrayed as a generic threatening villain. This is the moment where everyone gangs up on Moro with a surprise team attack and Goku blasts his arm off. But similar to Zamas, whereas we know surprise attacks in Dragon Ball Super, if your guard's down, you're worm food. Unless you've got regen. There's the writer's intention of having Moro get surprised, only for it to lead to something which is a phenomenal piece of art where his regenerated arm impales Goku, so I don't count these surprise teamwork attacks to put Goku's power above Moro. Maris is pretty damn impressive, to the point he takes on Moro in equal combat without even resorting to angel abilities. The first time he does resort to angel abilities is where he draws his angel staff, and that's when Maris' downfall begins. But the fact Maris, without angel abilities, is able to match the power and speed of 400 under Cillian is absolutely insane. Give or take, it's close to 400 under Cillian. That's my take on it. But when Maris does activate his angel abilities, he then begins to disappear. In the time Maris is fading away, he destroys Mora's crystals with ease, and in order to complete the Ultra Instinct training for Goku, the final trigger, and to teach Goku some valuable lessons. How strong is Angel Maris's full capabilities? Well, we will find out soon enough. Yeah. Goku then becomes Perfected Ultra Instinct. Let's just call it Ultra Instinct. I'm sick of applying things like Perfected and Mastered, when there's still a lot of work to be done, obviously. Moro 7-3 falls apart. There's nothing he can do against Ultra Instinct. As I said, the power of Ultra Instinct is awful. <laughs> Moro even powers up further than before, so another 1.25 times increase, but still nothing compared to Ultra Instinct. But hey, he gets a sense of Bean and Maris' abilities by getting his hand back, so that's good, right? When Angel Moro fights the Silver UI Goku, it's stated to be initially equal before Moro's body starts to break down, where he then has to become one with the planet in order to endure the power for a little while longer before he explodes from the overload of being above his body's limits. The peak absorbed Angel power and Ultra Instinct of Maris is pretty much equal to Ultra Instinct Goku, even when Moro is a planet, as Goku can parry his power, but Moro is still able to hit Goku, so it's still equal. Now what we all know is that Maris is not on the same level as Whis. There's different tiers of angels, and Maris is bottom of the ladder, but what we do know is Maris' is angel buff, because when he fought Moro without angel abilities, he was still in Ultra Instinct because it's a passive state angels are in. Ultra Instinct is not just for angels, it's a state of being. The Ultra Instinct multiplier given to Goku here, in this scale, doesn't work the same as with Maris due to its passive state and levels of it. It gets complex, but Maris's angel amp from his passive state of UI is 640,000 times, as that's the increase Moro needed to match the silver-haired UI. Remember, this doesn't apply to Whis or the other angels, but if you want a glimpse of where we can even begin to put Whis, then let's have some headcanon fun of what it could be at least. So Whis's non-angel abilities make him able to finger block planet Moro and therefore able to finger block UI Goku whilst not prioritizing combat. Instead, he's simply talking to Goku and finger blocking Moro. That is insane. So Whis's non-combat state is at least two times Ultra Instinct Goku and Moro here because he's so chill blocking a giant attack. Now imagine from there you increase Whis's power for combat purposes and then apply an angel amp from there. Remember, if we have Maris's angel amp at 640,000 here in this scale, just try to imagine what Whis's full angelic amp is. Potentially millions, and he's already tiers above UI Goku by simply talking to him. Whis could very well be millions stronger than Ultra Instinct Goku and Moro, and the Grand Priest could, in similar pattern, be millions stronger than Whis. We're talking Oko Decillions here, if not higher, just by simply guessing through Maris's power-ups. It's just busted, and pretty much sums up why it's forbidden for these angels to fight using their full power. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Ultra Instinct Goku fails against Moro, and Moro absorbs the power of Ultra Instinct Goku and much more around him. So for this, let's go with what actually matters right now. Moro's power essentially doubles by taking UI Goku's power. So I'll go with close to a 90% absorption rate, like I did before with Moro's absorptions, because Goku's still got some life left in him. Now here's where things get wacky. You see, when Goku was depleted, Vegeta gathered energy from himself and the remaining fighters to give to Goku. The power of Vegeta was the last amounts of Super Saiyan Blue Evolved. Bear in mind, Vegeta already said he was weakened, but he was still in Super Saiyan Blue Evolved, as when power drops too much, they change forms as shown previously. Here, Vegeta's Blue Evolved could be around 25% of its regular power. Combining that with everyone else, Vegeta's power is still pretty much the main bulk of energy given to Goku, which grants Goku power to use a Super Saiyan Blue perfection form. This is once again drained by Moro. Goku still doesn't have the power to go Ultra Instinct, but I want you to think about that for a moment. Not even Vegeta's full blue evolved power would be enough for Goku to go Ultra Instinct due to the raw difference in multipliers. So let's talk about Oob. Oob gives up some of his power which Goku absorbs and showcases a power above Planet Moro's current power. He overwhelms him by at least a tier. Oob gives energy effortlessly. It's a small amount of his power. It's just unknowingly. So maybe you don't want to hear this, but this is my take on it. A portion of Oob's power is stronger than Vegeta's maximum power. And the raw, untrained power of Oob is stronger than Ultra Instinct Goku's previous maximum power as it supercharged Goku Goku to go beyond his regular Ultra Instinct limits. So recontextualize the end of Z however you want, but based on the manga only of Dragon Ball Super, it did better than Blue Evolved Vegeta. How could Oob provide the power for Ultra Instinct if he's the reincarnation of Boo, where that kid Boo only had a tiny drop of the Grand Supreme Kai's god power, where even the buff Boo defeated the Grand Supreme Kai years ago? How can the reincarnation of Boo have the power to fuel Ultra Instinct? Well, it just is what it is. If you want to enjoy a good story, ignore power scales and creeps in Dragon Ball. These guys don't write with a power scale in mind, but if you want an inverse headcanon reason, how about because Oob is the reincarnation of Boo, but with a slight twist, where he evolves differently and he possesses different potential with the god power that was reincarnated. Because that's what it appears to be, Oob is not just a reincarnation, but a supercharged human prodigy. Think about it, the full god power that was inside the Grand Supreme Kai couldn't beat Moro Prime 10 million years ago, but a drop of his god power left that went into Boo, it can supercharge characters way stronger than the Grand Supreme Kai, such as Ultra Instinct Goku and Planet Angel Moro. It's just... whatever. It happened. In terms of Goku's new highest power, I've said it in the past with examples that when fighters, particularly Goku, absorb power greater than their own limits, they have proven time and time again they can make that power their own, where they either just simply absorb the raw power or have it break their own limits. I could give you five or six different examples of this, like I've mentioned in previous videos, but I won't waste any more video time. You'll have to research that part yourself. Now, in terms of Goku absorbing Vegeta's blue evolved power, it wouldn't break the limits of Goku's own inferior Super Saiyan blue perfected power because the dose he had doesn't exceed the maximum capabilities of his strongest power, Ultra Instinct. It's more so he's refueled enough to go blue, but not enough to go UI. It's that simple. If Vegeta gave Goku a power higher than Ultra Instinct, then that's a different story to Goku's overall base power growth. So the gap between Goku and Vegeta's base forms has now closed from Vegeta being 250 times stronger to now being 100 times stronger. Again, like I said, I wouldn't worry about this. Base forms are typically reset at the beginning of each new arc. But the pattern I always find at the end of each arc is Vegeta always has the better base form, but Goku's always the strongest high end because he has the strongest transformation. <laughs> I almost forgot about Beerus. Let's talk about him. He actually decides to get involved in this fight, insisting he's doing a favor for these guys. Beerus also says this is a special case where he will lend a hand and insists he will make it quick so the other gods of destruction don't see this happening. Beerus breaks the scale and leapfrogs everyone so far in order to satisfy the plot that Beerus is still a top dog. He even stands and watches the silver-haired Ultra Instinct in action, giving it a rare show of respect and also analyzing the fight in a way that has Beerus not get overwhelmed by the performance of the Silverhead Ultra Instinct surpassing him. He portrays something like a master being impressed by his student. So this is why Beerus' behavior seeing Ultra Instinct, as well as his confidence in the whole situation with Moro, still has Beerus above the Silverhead Ultra Instinct. 
He is a moving goalpost, but as I said previously, come up with whatever reason in verse you want. He trains off screen, he gets stronger when he sleeps, whatever. With the information we have in the manga and the implications, I'm comfortable putting Beerus even higher than the final levels of power of Goku and Moro here in the manga. And then even more than Ultra Instinct Goku in the Granola arc if necessary due to the strong bond between Beerus and the plot. The power creep for Beerus is insane, where now he's in the same ballpark or even more than Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta and Broly, two of our highest power so far in this scale. My bet he's higher than them based on what the plot has in store for Beerus. So overall, the strongest character so far in the Dragon Ball Super manga scale in terms of sheer raw power, obviously the hierarchy which include the Grand Priest and Whis, but not including Meris. Below Whis would be either Beerus or Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta with Broly close to, then the raw untrained power of Oob, and then finally Goku. If you agree or disagree, let me know your thoughts below on the Moro arc, but this is how I've gauged them in this power scale, and even if you have different answers, that's cool. I've remained consistent in my own power scaling principles throughout and tried to explain everything along the way without just claiming a number. At the end of the day, this is all just for fun. The narrative tells us one thing, but power creeps tell us something else. Power creeps are real in Dragon Ball, but if you want to just focus on the story, then you can, and if you want to enjoy it a lot, it's probably best to ignore the power creeps. Oh hey, I just want to give one more honorable mention to the return in Meris at the end of the arc, a Meris without angel abilities. Nothing was said about him being stripped about his combat powers, just his angel abilities. But we know how strong Meris is without angel abilities. Coming off the Moro arc, we actually don't get any situation where Goku and Vegeta's base forms tangle in training. They appear to be doing their own thing, Goku mainly with Whis. So at this point, I won't reset or balance out their base forms because we don't have that gauge between them yet. We just know they're still considered rivals, but this is because the two always crisscross in power, with Vegeta typically having a better base form and Super Saiyan Blue power, but Goku being the best with his UI buff. Vegeta says he will surpass Kakarot another way, but this doesn't refer to base forms. This is strictly referring to their max power in transformations and Goku's edge using UI compared to Vegeta's top power, which is Super Saiyan Blue Evolved right now. So right now, I won't apply any any numbers or training growths until I explain the power Granola obtains through the wish, because that explains where Goku and Vegeta are. I will explain Vegeta's base power a little later in the Granola fight, because there's something interesting that happens that suggests Vegeta's base is absurdly higher than Goku's. Here's something fun, Beerus says, his own power has no limit, which could provide a reason why Beerus is still the top dog as his mind is always on destruction and potentially continues to grow stronger in accordance with the plot. Goku and Vegeta's training would continue through the months and Vegeta learning destruction and Goku getting more efficient at Ultra Instinct. Now when the heat is tricked Goku and Vegeta into fighting Granola, we do see Vegeta train on the spaceship, which will be an additional 18 days of luxury training at Neaton. So yes, tons more evidence of continuous Goku and Vegeta training since the Moro arc, fully justifying the upcoming power-up. In Granola's introduction, we get information that all the 7-3 clones have the same data and capabilities of OG 7-3, which is pretty insane if you think about it. How does this work? If all clones have the same capabilities of OG 7-3, what was OG 7-3's last known power? non aliens Decillion stronger than base Goku in the Buu Saga? Take this statement how you want, but it gets completely outdone by Granola, who storms the ship and eliminates every clone. The clones attacked Granola, so there's no excuse they were jumped while asleep. But what we now run into is one of the most broken abilities in Dragon Ball Super, the Sharing Gun. This eye appears to have no equal in terms of speed and precision, which is a giant hack in itself, even for Granola's currently weak Dragon Ball Z Namek Saga power level. Defeating these clones is not a case where Granola's raw power destroys a bunch of ultimate Gohan level clones, no. Granola succeeded at this mission due to Intel and Oatmeal Assist in his already broken eye hack where the weak points on the forehead of each clone were hit by Granola's eye hack, which negated any difference in power as the weak points don't need insane power to penetrate. Remember the golden rule of Dragon Ball Super, if you've got weak points, vitals, or openings, you're worm food, regardless of power. And Granola's Sharingan hack 
takes advantage of openings. Theoretically, these clones could have killed Granola if it wasn't for the iHack and Oatmeal support. So back to Granola's power before his big wish. Yes, he is Namek Saga levels. Granola is blinded by revenge as he wants to kill Frieza for what happened in the past. However, even Granola admits he's not strong enough to take down Frieza. And the last known level of power these guys would know or would be aware of is first form Frieza from Namek Saga times. So even if Alec said Frieza's got stronger since then, is it reasonable to believe these guys know what Frieza's power is now? Is it reasonable to believe they know about final form Freezer on Namek? Can they even quantify a power jump from first form Freezer? Either way you want to cut the cake here, it's settled when Manito said, don't even try it Granola, you don't have the power to tangle with Freezer. There's no support and information that Manito has ever seen anything more or know anything more than Freezer's first form. Plus Alex says Gas might have beaten Granola in their little fight, but still wasn't 100% convinced. Though he did say he's the only member of the Heaters who can surpass Frieza, meaning Gas could potentially be a tier below first form Frieza on Namek, and Granola is a tier below this Gas. Until Granola wishes to be the strongest in the universe, putting him above the highest mortal power in Universe 7 in this power scale, which is Broly's current known max potential of 100 quindecillion. Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta doesn't count because he actually doesn't exist at this point unless a certain condition is met. But either way, Granola is completely busted. Think about it, a dragon summoned from two balls that don't even need a cooldown time, suddenly a deal exchange in life for power. Why not make him immortal, then wish for power? Busted wish combo. And with Granola's new power comes destruction energy, instant teleportation, and I'm surprised not Ultra Instinct either. But combine all this power with his already hack of an eye, you can really see, pun intended, why Granola is incredibly broken in terms of potential and speed. This guy could one-shot Moro. This guy could one-shot Jiren. Granola is deadly, and after the wish, at one point, he was the strongest in the universe. But you have to remember when that wish was made. It was made long before Goku and Vegeta even arrived on Planet Serial. And in that time, Goku and Vegeta continued to get stronger whilst Granola didn't train. This is what Vegeta later talked about in his fight with Granola. Being the strongest is just a moment in time. The next thing you know, that moment has passed. And this is a prime example. If you add up the time skips, there's about one to two months from the time Granola made the wish to the time he faces Goku and Vegeta. So that gap is going to shrink and justifies Goku and Vegeta's power get into Broly levels. So when Granola made the wish, I will put him a tier above Broly's current known max power, making Granola the strongest mortal in Universe 7 at this point. Remember, Granola stretched his lifespan almost to the brink to gain the strongest title, so it's reasonable to have him only a tier above Broly's current known best, as he sacrificed nearly everything just to gain that title, never mind add in any bonus power to make him even more superior. He didn't have the lifespan to do that. But here's the kicker. The power jump he had from that wish Considering he was lower than a 1 on this scale to start with, the wish powered him up over 125 quindecillion times. So think about it. This is all Manito's fault. If he had let Granola use those damn Dragon Balls and even wish for 1% of this power increase, sacrificing a couple of years of his life, Granola could have kept 100 years of his life and still one-shot the entire Dragon Ball Z cast. Freezer, King Cold, the Saiyans, Super Vegito if he wanted, and still one shot most of Dragon Ball Super. Damn that Manito. Manito is what we call a troublemaking plot creator. What a busted ass wish. But hey, let's continue. Granola fights Goku, and Goku has combined his autonomous movement with his Super Saiyan forms. Quick note, this does not give Goku any raw power boost. Only Sign and Ultra Instinct Silver grant the raw power boost. Goku's just combining the instinctive movement to his Super Saiyan forms to make him more effective in combat. And it works better in Super Saiyan forms than his base form. The battle between Goku and Granola is not a true representation of Granola's power. Granola was always dicking around with his clone. This was just a smidge of his power as revealed later on. With this battle with Goku is Granola being accustomed to his combat power and is still showcasing less battle experience at this level. As all of Goku's hits were managed when Granola had let his guard down or wasn't paying full attention or surprised at something. As proven when Goku pulled off a Kamehameha when Granola's defenses were open during his vital strike attack. 
Rules of Dragon Ball Super, guard down equals worm food. Granola eventually beats Blue with one precise hit after paying more attention, which proves my point just now. But the true demonstration of power between Goku and Granola is when Goku uses the Silver Haired Ultra Instinct. UI Silver decimates Granola to the point he can control him with a force. This is a big deal in Domination Multipliers. But the truth comes out when we find out Granola split his power and uses some of his power to make a clone. The clone fought Goku all along. Now how much power went into this clone? 50% due to him referring to the power as being split? Or something like 25% because he said he used some of his power? Either way is headcanon as this exact amount is unknown. But because we see Granola make multiple copies of himself in future battles, his power would split between however many there are. So in this case, only one clone. So I will say this one clone is 50%. Have it whichever way you want. But the clone rejoins Granola and was able to win through a vital strike attack after UI's accuracy dipped. More than enough. Simple really. But now let's get into some broken Vegeta power creeps. If you thought Goku and Granola were broken, Vegeta is about to take this cake. Vegeta is mainly on defense at the start, but what's crazy is Vegeta initially manages to stop Granola's energy blast. This is a complete Granola, by the way, not a clone. This is a raw power blast cancelled out by Vegeta. This is no joke. Vegeta notices Granola isn't used to his power, and it's more of a battle experience issue. Not that he doesn't have more power tucked away. He's just reckless with his power. But Vegeta reveals about himself that he's been growing stronger during this fight with Granola. Talk about broken Saiyan battle prowess coming back into the equation. Vegeta starts clashing with Granola, and even though Vegeta confirms Granola is stronger, Vegeta is dropped in some hurt in bombs to the point Vegeta can catch and cancel out some of Granola's serious vital point strike. This is followed by sadistically laughing off the damage. This broken display of power has Vegeta's blue evolved reach a level to what I feel is a tier below Granola, after the Saiyan battle prowess kicked in in order to do what he did. But that's how it was portrayed, Vegeta almost catching up to Granola in Super Saiyan Blue Evolved. This battle is more reliable to gauge their powers rather than Super Saiyan Blue Goku vs Granola because now Granola has experienced battle with Goku, has warmed up to that combat power, he's no longer a clone and he's now being challenged in sheer raw power by Vegeta where Granola's guard is actually up. This is a big deal for raw power with Vegeta. Compared to before, Goku was getting hits in because of Granola's carelessness. Remember when I said earlier there is something that happens in this battle that may suggest Vegeta's base form is above Goku's? This is it. Now we calculate Vegeta. Vegeta's Super Saiyan Blue Evolve now weighs up to Goku's Silver Haired Ultra Instinct at this point. Thank the Granola Arc's portrayal of Ultra Instinct for this. Plot activated power creep initiated, like it or lump it, Blue Evolve Vegeta tangled with Max Granola, and even took a vital point strike, laughing it off, where UI Goku got one shot after having an accuracy dip. Pathetic. I'm telling you, Manga Blue Evolved is always a powerhouse. But base Vegeta is even more impressive than that as that is the key to Vegeta's true power. Vegeta's base form right now can destroy everyone in the tournament of power due to the power creeps, including Jiren and Ultra Instinct Silver back then in the tournament. And this ridiculous illustration of power by Super Saiyan Blue Evolve Vegeta makes Vegeta's base form over 400 million times stronger than Goku's current base form. This is why they write stories not thinking about power scales, because when we do power scales, this is the monster they've created. Did I say this was supposed to make sense? It's not supposed to, but using consistent multipliers throughout this power scale and applying it to the story, it's a mess, and that's exactly what I expected, just like every other arc. It's draggable, it's written for the story, not as a power scale. That's something we have to accept. Story overrides power scale sense. As I've said before, it wouldn't be Dragon Ball if it wasn't messy, inconsistent, and nonsense. Continuing with the Granola vs Vegeta fight, Granola knocks Vegeta out of Super Saiyan Blue Evolved. To the point Vegeta is laughing like a sadistic freak, he's enjoying the damage and becomes Ultra Ego. Now Ultra Ego doesn't work like previous forms in Dragon Ball Super. The way Vegeta performed against Granola with Super Saiyan Blue Evolved, Ultra Ego isn't a giant multiplier at all at the start. In fact, that's not what makes it deadly. What makes it deadly is the power boosts whilst Vegeta is in the form. Which as long as he can sustain the damage and remain in Ultra Ego, the power 
jumps are unlimited, unbounded, so to speak. Pretty much what Beerus and Vegeta said. It really is a double-edged sword. So Ultra Ego is initially not as big of a multiplayer as Ultra Instinct. The question is, does Vegeta's base form get stronger through Ultra Ego, or does just the Ego form grow? I have my interpretation of this because of how different it is. Vegeta refers to Ultra Ego as innate power, and that the power is his own. It goes deeper than just base form. It goes deeper than set multipliers. It's ever-growing. The more he is damaged, the deeper the power becomes that goes beyond his base form limits. So my interpretation is that only the Ultra Ego form multiplier continues to grow. You could give it a set multiplier if you want, and then see the damage boosts amplifying Vegeta's base form, but then you're settling for the Ultra Ego Multiplier being just a small bit above Super Saiyan Blue Evolved. But to be honest, it doesn't look that way to me. The manga portrays Vegeta's Ego power growing, like a berserk estate, and that's what I'll go with. Think of Legendary Super Saiyan and how power spikes happen in the fight, but this time Vegeta's Ego form itself is amping. Upon transforming, Vegeta is wrecking Granola in every possible way, to the point Granola can't even detect Ultra Ego Vegeta move. Vegeta then tanks Granola's charge and attack and laughs it off. After the hit, Vegeta then says the damage will make him stronger. Granola calls Vegeta an entirely different person after experiencing this further boost. Vegeta dominates him more so. Vegeta then tanks Granola's energy blast. We know energy blasts multiply power, so the force of Granola's attack is at least 1.5 times Granola's raw power. Vegeta tanks it, actually showcasing 3 times Granola's raw combat power. Vegeta takes a rapid fire energy burst head on, his eager boosts once again, then Granola has to activate a barrier. Vegeta then smashes through it with raw power. Barrier powers have multipliers, as Piccolo had more raw power than Android 17. Then he used a Hellzone grenade, which is an attack force higher than his raw combat power. For example, a Kamehameha is on average 2.2 times his base. Gallic Gun was 3 times, Special Beam Cannon was 3 to 4. So the Hellzone grenade and the mass amount of key used in it from collected energy blasts can easily be a combined 3 times Piccolo's raw combat power when they all hit at the same time. 17's barrier negated it, and it's officially stated in the Daizenshu to negate something, you have to emit twice the power. So 17's barrier was around six times Piccolo's combat power. If we go by that benchmark, because we know how vague Dragon Ball is when it comes to powers, Ultra Ego Vegeta is stronger than Granola's energy barrier, so at least 1.5 times the barrier to bust through it without any resistance when he tried. Ultra Ego is growing very fast in this battle and is currently 7.5 times Granola. So in terms of Ultra Ego amps, we can make a rough estimate for each boost. He's had three damage boosts so far, so let's keep it simple and average out the boost each time, because it's impossible to quantify how much damage he received with with each boost, but he became roughly 3.75 times stronger through three boosts in my scale so far, which when calculated from when he initially fought Granola, it works out to around 1.5 times per boost, which is a tremendous power up in a close battle initially. And a quick reminder, it's just my interpretation. This is not official, but you knew that, right? We're just here for fun. Vegeta then gets purposely damaged by Granola again to get another boost. Granola rips off Oatmeal and then attacks Vegeta again with the city and some more destruction, further amp in Vegeta. Now here's the kicker. Saiyans aren't the only ones who start getting stronger in battle. It's at this point Granola reveals his Cerulean blood now grows stronger in battle. So plot power up for Granola. Give the man a round of applause. He actually matches Vegeta in battle at one point. And you can see what I mean about ridiculous power creeps in this arc. They happen so quickly in battle, but I will definitely count this. Granola equalizes Vegeta, but also damages Vegeta, giving him a further boost. Vegeta tanks Granola's oncoming rapid fire burst, so I put him at two times Granola at this specific point. Remember, it keeps changing, but then he gains another damage boost for Ultra Ego, and he blasts Granola away. Vegeta begins to feel faint at this point. He's grown excessively and claims he's taken too much damage. The balance is off. Granola gets up and, of course, gains another power boost because he's a Saiyan, I mean Cerulean. He blasts through and destroys Vegeta's energy ball, causing more damage to Vegeta, so another boost before Vegeta runs out of steam there. In this situation, it was blast versus blast. Granola hit a vital point of the energy ball with his double sharing gun. What's crazy is Granola's Cerulean blood is outpacing Ultra Ego's growth at this point, so whatever Vegeta climbs to, Granola exceeds it by a bit. A technique by the God of Destruction to help a Saiyan continuously grow unbounded is beaten in a race by a guy with three years left to live. 
I love Dragon Ball Super, but here we go. Granola chases down Vegeta and blasts him further. So one more boost to Ultra Ego. But this is the one that reaches the limit and Vegeta falls out of Ego. All right, so Goku interferes in this fight. He saves Vegeta and hits Granola away whilst in Super Saiyan Blue. Now again, guard down equals worm food, regardless of power. Remember that golden rule of Dragon Ball Super. Now what you must realize is Granola only goes for vital strikes, but Goku can now use his instincts to evade the vital strike damage somewhat. This surprises Granola to which Goku takes advantage of the lowered guard and makes Granola, you guessed it, worm food. To the point Granola takes Super Saiyan Blue's punch on the chin, smiles, and finishes him in one kick. So no, I won't be giving Super Saiyan Blue Goku any massive plot buffs here, because it was portrayed Goku only learned how to cancel out vital strikes, not a game of raw power to the finish. But it's not over for Ultra Ego. Vegeta rejoins the fight and battles with sheer raw willpower. His Ultra Ego form activates and starts overwhelming Granola to the point Granola is worried. So this breather for Vegeta has actually allowed Ultra Ego to reactivate stronger than ever. So it gained a boost during its recovery. Vegeta takes further damage yet again, a smile of Ego to confirm the boost. But Granola also gains the power to once again rival the damaged Ultra Ego boosts. Vegeta gets pinned down and Granola blasts his face off. This is the attack that knocks Vegeta out of Ego, so I will apply one final boost from that damage to Ultra Ego, but Vegeta becomes too wounded to sustain the power and he faints. Vegeta's Ultra Ego has grown 175 times stronger from boosts whilst in the Ego form, to where the multiplier at this point of my power scale reaches the same level as Ultra Instinct Sign, that being 2 quadrillion, and the multiplier is only going to get higher from here. It is truly unbounded. At this rate, the Ultra Ego multiplier can indeed reach the same multiplier as the Silver Head Ultra Instinct, which is incredible. But at this point in sheer raw power alone, Vegeta has surpassed Goku's Silver Head Ultra Instinct, thanks to his base form and Ultra Ego damage boost. Granola says he will summon every bit of power to finish off Vegeta. Granola summons the power to blast Vegeta, but Goku knocks Granola out of the attack, but we don't see the energy disperse, so seeing this, Granola didn't use that power and still has it. Although he's very close to his limit, which is explained shortly, but for now, Granola is still extremely strong, but then Gas arrives, the new strongest in the universe. Gas finally rocks up and takes Granola out by surprise with his energy pincers, but even when Granola attacks him from behind, Gas begins overwhelming him. Granola is close to his limit at this moment, so I put Gas at 1.75 times Granola's best initially due to him easily dominating him. Goku steps up to fight Gas using his Super Saiyan Blue form. Now Goku is able to snap Gas's energy sword with his initial surge of power, but then fails to land a single blow and gets pulverized by Gas, knocking Goku out of Super Saiyan Blue. Goku would put all his remaining power into this small portion of the battle to initially step up to Gas, but he could not sustain it in order to be equal to Gas. He might have gotten stronger, but we can't calculate anything reliably here, as there's no statements of strength increase, unlike when Vegeta fought Granola. Granola gets a Senzu, and also gets equipped with Oatmeal support, so using that with his busted Sharingan, as well as using skill against Gas's inexperience with power, he is able to balance out the fight, because power isn't everything, right? Right? Well, when Gas decides to use his full power, Granola's punch can't even get through Gas's aura. So I put Gas's power up a tier from here. The only way Granola can keep up with Gas is using more precise instant transmission. So again, skill is keeping him in this fight, and he's trying to make Gas open for an attack. In other words, worm food, because that's the golden rule of Dragon Ball Super. Keep your guard up. But either way, Granola's Shadow Clone Jutsu and Vital Strike Blast helps him take down Gas's superior power. Pretty cool. But I'm also going to give Granola a tier boost in power due to the fact he's a Cerulean, and if he gained power against Ultra Ego passively, he can gain some here. Alec gets disappointed in Gas and tells him to unleash his instincts. This is where things get crazy. I put him way above double Granola's current power, but I'll explain this number for Gas a little later when Goku and Vegeta take him on at full power. But the unleashed power is around a 3 times amp to Gas's power, which makes a huge difference here. If you guys want to know how strong Bardock was in the flashback when he fought this unleashed Gas, well Gas 
was just overall inferior back then compared to what he is now, but this unleashed power and Bardock Saiyan Surge back then would not have exceeded first form Frieza, so take that how you want. Anyway, back to Gas versus Goku. Goku was able to hit him in base form because of the memory of Bardock affecting Gas. Again, guard down equals worm food. Vegeta gives Goku his remaining chi. That's the juicy potent stuff from deep down, the life energy. So Vegeta is now out of the equation fully. But Goku can only manage to summon some Super Saiyan Blue. But again, it makes no difference to Gas. And this is just another drawn out fight where Gas statistically could end this in one shot if the plot deemed it so. Goku plays with instant transmission for a while and lures Gas away, only fighting with pure defense and slowly losing ground. Again, no actual combat comparison to Gas as Goku is running for his life. When Goku and Vegeta get back to Manito's, Manito's healing is all over the place. At one moment he says the 20 minutes before Gas returns isn't enough time to heal Granola, but during that time he heals Granola, listens to the whole Bardock replay on the Scouter, and even heals up Goku and Vegeta to where their wounds all disappear. It's later explained that Manito's healing had evolved recently. So I put this down to that development because Goku and Vegeta are able to transform into Ultra Instinct and Ego and surge a tremendous aura the moment Gas returns, to the point they look at their most strongest here. So just where are Goku and Vegeta's powers now? Vegeta's Ego was around 466 times stronger than Goku's Ultra Instinct Silver thanks to the constant boost earlier against Granola. But here in the fight, Goku and Vegeta fight on par with each other. They are seemingly as equals and again, viewing themselves as rivals as they continue engaging with Gas. So somehow, some way Goku has been growing stronger over the course of this battle or he's just got any plot power up now but either way we could put it down to some of the heals and skirmishes with gas earlier living up to the same battle prowess buff. Gas, however, still is able to toy with both of them. It's insulting. Vegeta gets hit by Gas, thus giving him an ultra ego boost. This hit actually surprises Gas, to where he's busted open. Gas hurts Vegeta even more, giving him more prime fuel, as Vegeta would say. Overall, I accounted Gas damaging Vegeta around five different times, so I apply five different boosts, and I try to remain consistent with the boost amp, but Vegeta gets seriously hurt by Gas, and the final damage boost he gains is the one that Gas braces for his life before Vegeta burns out. Gas knew this attack was going to be painful as hell, so this is why I put Vegeta's final ego power above Gas somewhat before he burns himself out. Goku is then able to utilize what's referred to as true ultra instinct, which is essentially ultra instinct sign plus emotions, and it's stated he's stronger than Gas. In fact, it's fair to put true Ultra Instinct Goku at this point at the same level of raw power as Ultra Ego Vegeta's final boost, except without the damage making him faint, which still keeps Goku and Vegeta's raw power relevant here. But what's crazy is that Goku's emotional amp, it amps his Ultra Instinct sign more than the Silver Hate Ultra Instinct No Emotion amp does. It's really hard to fathom that considering the fact that Whis has been drilling the methods of eliminating emotions and thoughts during battle to improve Goku and Vegeta, but now Goku goes back to emotions and it's the better amp all along. Whatever, I guess. We've come a long way in this manga power scale just to quit now. I'm just counting it. And I don't care about overall story inconsistencies in the manga anymore. Goku manages to beat this form of gas and that's all that matters. Matters. So how strong is this new emotional boost for Goku now? While True Ultra Instinct is around six times stronger than the Silver Haired Ultra Instinct without emotion. So the emotion boost is about six times better than the original Ultra Instinct sign going into original Ultra Instinct Silver. That's absurd. So a six million times increase from sign. But either way, Gas transforms again, didn't see that coming, and he's a clear tank in domination multiplier over True Ultra Instinct. Goku can't even see this guy move, and Gas has control over him with the Force. Gas's power and body are out of sync, and his age is being sacrificed, burning through his life power to maintain this new level of power. But what's interesting, Granola rejoins the fight and aims to charge up the mother of all blasts and get a clear shot on Gas whilst Goku distracts him. This is one of those being open equals worm food moments, but Granola's power shocks Gas to the point he is far more relevant than before considering the power-ups, so I put Granola at least on par with true Ultra Instinct Goku and Ultra Vegeta here. Hey, he's a Cerulean just like a Saiyan. They all get the same perks.
But then we get a glimpse of Goku awakening to the silver haired Ultra Instinct and this scares the living hell out of Gas who can't do anything and is launched into the sky with ease. This power of Goku had to have succeeded his true Ultra Instinct power to be portrayed like this. Otherwise, why wouldn't he have gone into true Ultra Instinct to hold Gas back? If true Ultra Instinct did better than the silver haired Ultra Instinct did earlier in the fight, we have to consider what power Goku tapped into here. It's really confusing but I have my thoughts on this given the information we have up to this moment in the manga. I think Goku initially tapped into the silver haired Ultra Instinct plus emotions which created an insane power up for a brief second, enough to create an opening for Granola's final move. So for a split second, we see the true silver haired Ultra Instinct. And it's essentially true Ultra Instinct with a silver amp because emotions are already installed. This would make sense seeing as this should be what Goku is aiming for, to use his emotions with his strongest Ultra Instinct form. Either way, how friggin' strong would this silver haired Ultra Instinct be with emotions? A monstrous power, the highest power yet. And this is based on if he did use silver Ultra Ultra Instinct with emotion, this could have just been a final hurrah with his remaining power to create a Susano. but I still find it interesting that the chosen form at this point for one final push was the Silver Haired and not True Ultra Instinct. Anyway, Granola takes out Gas and that's it, right? Well, not quite. Goku, Vegeta and Granola get healed to full power by Minaito and now things get really pointless in power creeps. Gas is still around and his power is intact, but he's on his last of his life energy and he's a walking zombie. He can use the force to deal with Goku and Vegeta at the same time. Gas is even more reckless than before, so any potential Goku and Vegeta boosts are cancelled out due to the reckless fight in Harmon himself. We can give Vegeta an ego boost due to sustaining damage here, but Vegeta's base form at this point finishes this arc at 1 million times stronger than Goku's base form. However, Ultra Instinct multipliers are higher, which levels the playing field between them. It all comes crashing down when Frieza turns up and becomes Black Frieza, one shot in Gas, one shot in Ultra Ego Vegeta, one shot in True Ultra Instinct Goku. And I'm glad because the numbers have gotten ridiculous, absolutely pointless. No one needs to be this strong. Dragon Ball Super needs a complete new full scale guide to explain everything because this is what happens when we apply fan speculation from vague information to what's happening story wise. Because Black Frieza, how do we even quantify him? We know he's at least Bare minimum, two times gas for one shot in him, especially after gas jacked up and went all out in his final moment. Of course, Freeze has been training for 10 years, but has he prepared for Silver Ultra Instinct plus emotions? The glimpse that we may have seen earlier? It's likely Black Freezer has even prepped for fusion. So let's work out a theoretical Ultra Instinct Gogeta right now. Best of A plus best of B, then multiply by 100, which is a combination and midpoint of all fusion lore and guides that I worked out. Then go ahead and add whatever multiplier you want on a theoretical Gogeta. True Ultra Instinct, let's do it. 816, whatever the hell that number is. And Black Freezer could be anywhere up to that point. But let's go with the ultimate low ball and put Black Freezer at around double the power of gas. We can't actually quantify an exact power up for the black form, but we can estimate Freezer's growth. Freezer before Resurrection F was less than a 1 in this scale. During Resurrection F as Golden Freezer, he was around 600 billion in this scale. Tournament of Power Freezer was around 26 septillion, with the golden form in the manga only being around a 50 times increase like Super Saiyan, which is kind of fitting. Final form Freezer is just too damn strong from training, man. And his growth is even greater when he's mental training. So it could just be he's become more efficient in training or simply the plot. We can apply the gap from Resurrection F to Tournament of Power, then magnify it by 10 just to get our heads around one possibility. So going by this, his final form right now is stronger than base Vegeta and base Goku. So either Freezer's black form has a multiplier from final form greater than true Ultra Instinct, which is 12 sextillion bare minimum, or his black form is not as high, but his training has escalated his final form even higher than what I just said. Or it could be a combination of both. He could have grown even further than that. I'm only going with Black Freezer being a bare minimum of around two times true Ultra Instinct. There's a chance he could be far higher than a true Ultra Instinct Vegito. Who the heck really knows? And who really cares by this point? Broly, Beerus, whatever. It's all pointless levels of power now. Dragon Ball Super just continues to rise in raw power creeps. It's an extremely powerful show in just raw power alone. I haven't even covered feats in this power scale. It's just raw power. And the whole purpose of making this manga power scale was to prove that power scales don't always fit stories like a glove. And if you want to enjoy a good story, don't think too hard about scaling because they don't write with a detailed scale in mind. Dragon Ball will forever be busted in raw jumps. 
versus battles in Dragon Ball are often pointless because anyone can get killed if their guard is down. Anyone can become as strong as the plot requires them to. It's however the battle is written. Anyone can gain a boost in the blink of an eye. Just look at the growth during the Granola battle. It's all about which character you use at a very specific point in the story. But seeing as we made it this far, here's the final multipliers of forms for Goku and Vegeta so you can fight your friends with. And just a quick reminder guys, if you want to compare this scale to my other scales involving Kid Buu vs Super Saiyan 3 Goku as a benchmark, you need to divide all answers in this manga power scale by 400 to get the answer you want because base Goku in the Buu Saga is a 1 in this scale, Super Saiyan 3 Goku in the Buu Saga would be a 400. So that's why you must divide all answers in this scale by 400 so that it makes Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Kid Buu as a theoretical 1 in this scale for the purposes of gauging from that landmark. So for example, low ball in Black Freezer to 1 sep 10 decillion, his true reading from Kid Buu would be 2 sex decillion times stronger. And with that being said, my calculator is fried and this power scale has really fried my brain from all of the pointless numbers. If I've made a mistake somewhere, show me at least some mercy. It's not easy to stay consistent with the Dragon Ball Super Manga power creeps and try not to miss a single digit in 50 digit numbers for hundreds of calculations. But thank you so much for watching this series, and remember, hitting the like button really helps out more than you know. Maybe one day I will add the final chapters onto the Dragon Ball Super Manga story, but it really would be pointless. Maybe one day I will find the energy to tackle a Dragon Ball Super anime. So, until we meet again.